Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto had mysterious dejutsu, part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, and also check the description. So let's begin the story. Long ago, there was a great, living power that roamed the land. This power was known as the Juubi. A monster of unfathomable strength and bloodlust, it roamed the land. Its reign would go without obstacles, bringing an era of terror and uncertainty to all people, until one man rose up to combat the beast. This man was known as the Rakuto Senen, or the Sage of the Six Paths. This man met and fought the beast in a battle that shaped the face of the planet. The sage defeated the beast by sealing it within himself, becoming the first individual known as it to exist. He was elevated to God's status and essentially ruled the world. Eventually though, as time passed, the man would die of old age, and upon this, the Juubi would be released upon the world once more. So before he passed away, the sage sealed the body of the Juubi away from it. He then divided the chakra of the beast into nine, or to be more accurate, sub-monsters. The one-tailed raccoon a geokinetic psychopath, focused only on destruction. The two-tailed cat a massive Nico possessing an otherworldly flame. The three-tailed turtle a giant leviathan of a beast, living in the water's depths. The four-tailed monkey a red-furred titan, who possessed the power of lava. The five-tailed dolphin horse a graceful agile monster whose sleek form and fur, belied a startling savagery. Dot. The six-tailed slug an amorphous demon who was the dark incarnation of the legendary slug summons. The seven-tailed horn beetle a massive winged beast that ruled the land and skies. The eight-tailed octopus an amphibious horn that resembled an odd paradoxical fusion. And last but not least, the nine-tailed fox, most powerful of the nine, with unmatched physical might. As to the body of the Juubi itself, the only clue is a riddle to look towards the night sky, where all are aligned at the beginning of the end he then divided up each of his and the Juubi's powers among those he deemed worthy. How was the save able to do this, you might ask? Sealing inside a human does not go without drastic consequences on the human, and thus through the Juubi, the sage gained additional features, almost outright giving himself the title of divinity. Some would say he became far more than human, in a transcendent way. If one were to meet the sage, one would have noticed that the one of the most striking features about were his eyes. Legends are unclear as to which of the eyes first, the Juubi or the sage, but either way people claim those eyes enabled him to see them all. They were often referred to as the eyes of the Juubi. Each eye was a brilliant shining white in the iris, however, six rings came in from each of the outer edges of each eye, reaching all the way to the center of the pupil. Lastly, each ring had three tomo along it, varying in curves. The sage somehow divided these eyes into three separate individual groups, to the people who would begin the Hyuga line, they who desired order and struturable vol, by Akigen, the all-seeing eye. To the person who would begin the Achiha, who desired strength and power above all, he gifted the Sharingan, the copy wheel eye. To the last and most obscure clan he gave the Rinnegan, the Samsara eye. Sadly, the passage of time has eroded knowledge of her clan, as well as her clan's answer to the sage's question, and therefore the Rinnegan with it. Lastly, the sage passed down his legendary technique, the Mokuten, to the Senju clan, who desired love and compassion in order to provide a means of balance and controlling the tailed beasts. The sage set the greatest example of all in his usage of chakra. Through this energy was the birth of ninjutsu, the manipulation of the elements and manipulation of the senses, and a new power source for certain machines. Thus the modern shinobi world was born. Alliances and betrayals existed in the centuries following. Eventually, the modern shinobi villages were formed, the lands of fire, water, wind, earth, and lightning, with several smaller countries and subsidiaries. The nine-tailed beasts roamed the world, and the existence of the Juubi and the sage would pass into obscurity. However, the tailed beasts still exist, a constant reminder of the struggles of the past, and that is where our story begins. The Kyubi's attack. Birth of a half-demon. From the wisdom of the great toad elder of Mount Mayaboku, a great rage has appeared in the world. Its wrath will be halted by three sacrifices, and in doing so the first of many a key will be unlocked. October 10, 12 years ago, the Kayubi no Kitsune, aka. The nine-tailed fox loomed over the shinobi village of Konoha. Its tails, flowing widely, seemed to increase the size of its terrifying visage. A path of destruction was left in the fox's wake. Hundreds upon hundreds of shinobi lay dead. It didn't matter how they were killed, the end result was still the same. Dismembered remains littered the battlefield, along with pools of blood. These were the lucky ones, in the sense that there were at least some remnants left that proved they existed. Many had risen to fight, but their lives were snuffed out in an instant, being either crushed underneath the kitsune's enormous paws, disappearing down its gaping maw, or disintegrated by its malicious chakra, its very presence a pestilence upon the battlefield, completely transforming the area it stood from lush forest to desolate waste, where no grass or trees grew. Weapons were nearly useless against it, its thick fur, skin, and chakra repelled most attacks, and those few that actually breached its defenses would heal up instantly. 
Lastly, using said attacks required that the shinobi get too close for comfort to the beast's fangs, claws, and tails. One man stood on tall, confronted the beast. His name was Minato Namikas. He was the fourth Hokage of Konoha and the protector of its people. He truly loved the village, leading it to victory against all forces that would attack it. Its people would revere him, and his enemies, well, those that still live, would submit to him, referring to him as the Yellow Flash of Konoha. Minato stood atop the toad boss, Gamabunta. Although cantankerous, the toad was immensely loyal to Minato and thus fought valiantly to defeat the fox. Despite this though, he was outmatched and he knew it, though he'd never admit out loud. Although the toad rivaled the fox in size, the fox was much faster and more agile, and its regeneration, raw ferocity, and physical power gave it a massive edge over him. Already Gamabunta's body had bruises and gouges, and thus he was bleeding profusely. The chief toad also held one webbed hand up against his chest, breathing heavy, with inlet gasps of pain. A nasty scar traveled over his left eye, though the organ itself miraculously sustained no damage due to a slash being a very near miss. The toad was at his limit, and he knew it was only by a miracle that he was still alive as it was. In fact, come to think of it, dot, the fox had been sighted en route towards Konoha. Attempts to deter or delay it had been unsuccessful, almost as if the fox were dead set on reaching the village. Minato, something is up the boss remarked. Yeah, Bunta, I picked up on it, to Minato replied. Look at the fox's eyes. This attack came out of nowhere, there's no feral intelligence, or nothing indicating that the fox is in its own mind. It's like something is controlling it, and if the fox were serious, I doubt either of us would still be here right now. The elder's prophecy said that a great rage would appear, what if it isn't the fox? Leonardo darkly mused inwardly to himself as he considered that possibility. He had his suspicions, especially ones regarding certain masked individuals, but now was neither the time nor the place to investigate. He was the last line of defense and if the fox beat him, then Konoha was doomed. As Hokage, he couldn't let that happen. His people had sacrificed enough already to stop the fox, and he couldn't let that be in vain. Already a massive chakra blast had destroyed most of one of the village walls. If he hadn't diverted it by using Gamabunta and himself as a distraction, the damage would have been far worse. He knew that there was only one option left. He wished he could say that he thought of it himself, but his inspiration was from elsewhere. Heh, that crazy old monkey. The three people put Bunta's head behind Minato. The figures stepped up, revealing an old man and young blonde woman carrying a small bundle. The three of them were dressed in shinobi gear, the oldest of the three wielding a massive staff bigger than he was, whereas the third figure curiously enough, a person that resembled an odd fusion of a white-haired man and a toad dressed in a green and red kabuki outfit, with two frogs sitting on his shoulders. These figures were here as in Suratobi the former third Hokage, along with two of his students Jureya and Tsunade of the Sanin. Jurei was in his rarely seen sage mode, the two toads Fukasaku and Shima on his shoulders. All were worn out, tired, and wounded from the battle. Saratobi stepped forward and addressed his successor, Minato I implore you, let me perform instead. I'm old, and I've lived a long and happy life with my family. I've conferred with you and Jureya over this deed, and I can do this just as well as you can. He placed his staff down at his side, and in a puff of smoke it transformed, revealing the Monkey King Enma. The summon remained silent, but nodded to his acceptance of Saratobi's decision. Stepping in front of his sensei Jureya, the toad san and addressed his student, Gaki, for once the geezer has a point. But, as much as I'd like to see the old man finally out of my hair and not criticizing me for my research, I can't let him do this. He deserves to live out the rest of his days in peace. Let me instead. Then, as if playing some morbid game of follow the leader, Tsunade shoved Jureya out of her way, taking precautions not to disturb the bundle she carried, opened her mouth to speak, but stopped at Minato's outstretched hand. Smiling regrettably, the Yandame responded, thanks, I really do appreciate the offers. But old man, we need the best possible chance to seal the Kai Ubi. Admit you're not what you were in your prime. Saratobi glared annoyingly at this remark, but still listened. If your body gives out before the sealing completes, then who knows what could happen. The sealing when carried out successfully works 100%, but nobody knows what could occur if it's halted halfway. The seal could be incomplete, or it could end up in a chain reaction that would annihilate Kanoha. Plus only a newborn's chakra network has the best chance of fusing with the beasts in order to maintain the seal. Turning towards the Toad Sanin, Sensei, who is going to maintain Kanoha's spy networks if you die? You're needed because there are contacts that only answer to you. Besides, if there is more afoot here, then you're the one most likely to find out, as well as stop them preemptively if needed. Lastly, to Tsunade, no offense, Lady Tsunade, but you still have Dan to live for. After what you've already lost in your brother, I can't ask you to give him up. Besides, I need you to check up on his chakra networks and body after the sealing is done. You're the world's greatest medic for a reason, and I need you to take care of any unexpected developments. Speaking of which, what about the operation, was it a success? How is she doing? 
At this, Tsunade's face fell, and she did not meet Minato's eyes. Minato gasped in understanding and fell to his knees, realizing the truth, no she couldn't have. Tsunade, the slug Sanin stated, began, bitterness in her voice, there were complications with the procedure, especially given what you and she asked me to do. Her body lost a lot of blood, and much of her biological systems were badly damaged. She asked to see him before it happened, and then she was gone. Reaching into the pocket on her ninja vest, she produced a photograph and handed it to Minato. She asked me to tell that she has no regrets, that she was happy to have loved you, this village, and him. At this she unwrapped a small bundle in her arms, revealing a, surprisingly, given the fierce raging battle, sleeping newborn boy. Sun gold hair fell from his head. Silently, Minato took the bundle and the picture, cradling the infant in his arms. He then looked at the photograph, and tears streamed down his face. I'm so sorry Dottie muttered in a small voice to the child, for what happened to her. I hope that someday you can forgive me for leaving you all alone and what else I'm about to do, but I I'll understand if you don't grow up to be a strong person that never gives up regardless of what happens. It doesn't matter to me what you choose, so long as it's what you want to do, that you never go back on your word and what you believe in. Get people who are precious to you and protect them with all your might. I'll always love you and be watching over you Naruto. Suddenly the toad boss's head that they stood on shook violently as Gamabunta shuffled nervously. Minato, I understand your pain, and believe me when I say that I really had Teto break up this touching moment, nice kid by the way, but in case you haven't noticed there's a rather large angry freaking fox heading right at us the toad boss immediately fired off a tepndam at the charging fox. The water bullet distracted it enough for Gamabunta to leap out of the fox's path, coming down hundreds of feet away. Minato and Jureya flew into action. Jureya opens up one of his many scrolls, and upon which Minato laid the infant Naruto on, when Gamabunta moved again, this time taking a massive leap to dodge a vicious claw swipe from the Kaiubi. Gamabunta, hold still the toad sage screamed. While the four ninjas could anchor themselves to the toad's head with their chakra, the same was not true for the infant Naruto who nearly was thrown off. Now the child chose to wake, but instead of crying ironically enough was laughing giddily, as if this were some macabre joyride. Uchiha no jutsu a large poof of smoke, and suddenly the slug queen Katsayu appeared next to Gamabunta. I'll distract the fox, but for sake hurry up, Tsunade leapt over to her summon's head. The slug fired off an acid blast at the Kaiubi who dodged it. Then, growling menacingly, it set its eyes on this new target. Minato inscribed a series of seals into Naruto's belly. He then turned to face Kaiubi. Bunta, I need you to get closer. The toad obliged, although inwardly he was thinking this a suicidal maneuver. Saratobi sets off a signal flare to Tsunade, then flashes through a series of sign language signals. Tsunade nodded upon seeing this, and Katsaya fired a massive amount of grey slime all over the Kaiubi, which hardened instantly. Slug style, snail shell prison. Knowing that it wouldn't hold the fox for long Minato took his only chance. Before he made his move he tossed a scroll to Jiraiya. When you feel that he is ready, give that to him. Amabunta lunged forward, whereupon Minato leapt off the toad's head and flung one of his trademark kunai at the fox's exposed face. It hit its target, and he warped over to the fox's head in an instant and ran through the required hand seals and thrust his hand straight down into the fox's head. As soon as these requirements were met, a searing pain went through Minato's body, and he turned his head to see the Shinigami itself floating behind the fourth hokage, clad in its ethereal attire, thrusting its arm through his chest. No words were spoken between the two, but to his surprise the Shinigami gave an almost imperceptible nod. It was almost as if it was acknowledging him directly, not just viewing him as one of many individuals foolish enough to call upon him. Giving the specter a solemn yet respectful smile, Minato turned his head back and directed towards the Kaiubi. The act of sealing apparently was enough to release the Kaiubi from whatever had influenced it. Realizing what was to be its fate, the fox instantly broke free from the immobilizing slime of Katsayu in a massive outward blast of chakra and gave a primal roar of fury as it felt itself succumbing to the dot. The Kaiubi no Kitsune, the greatest of them, literally began to disintegrate before the survivor's eyes. Its massive body transformed into a large mass of red chakra. Then the chakra started to disappear in increasing amounts, almost like water running down a drain. The chakra was all drawn into one point, the seal on the infant Naruto's belly. Just before the last bits of chakra receded, another ear-splitting roar erupted, the last testimony of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, attempting to fight its fate by the Shinigami's unyielding will. Minato stood still, his body held up by the last bits of the fox's chakra, still potent enough to be solid. As the last bits were drawn in, his foothold vanished and his body began to plummet, the Shinigami's faint specter fading away. The yellow flash thought once again of all that he had done, of Naruto, of the village, and of her, and gave one final, rueful smile. Remembering one last time his words to Naruto, Minato Namikaze, the yellow flash of Konoha, died, the eternal Shinigami claiming its payment.
Before the Yandane could hit the ground, Gamabunta's massive tongue flashed out and caught his summoner. Laying him gently on the ground the tongue withdrew, and the forms of Jureya and Siratobi landed next to the fourth, with Tsunade landing soon after to spelling Katsaya. Tsunade immediately took Naruto out of Jureya's hands and began a diagnostic medical ninjutsu, while Jureya and Siratobi began checking the seal's structure. Vitals are working perfectly, no outward defects, Tsunade muttered as she began to run her diagnostic. The seal is holding up as well. Jureya said, gesturing at the still glowing markings on Naruto's stomach. Saratobi breathed a sigh of relief. Hang on a sec what the hell is this Tsunade's teacher and teammate immediately were at her side. His chakra networks are increasing at an exponential rate. The seal markings glowed a brilliant red forcing her to back off from her monitoring position. All three shinobi went into a combat stance. King Enma stood alongside Saratobi, his fists clenched and his fangs bared. Saratobi, prepare yourself. We must stop it from breaking free, here and now. Saratobi immediately took up the first hand sign for the Shaikif Jin seal. Old or not, if all had to do was provide a way to reinforce the seal by sacrificing himself, he would do it in a heartbeat. Amabunta, having not yet dispelled in case of something like this, brandished his knife and held its massive point directly over Naruto's tiny body, ready to drive it down in an instant. The toad boss steeled his mind regrettably. By all means he did not want to stoop as low as to kill the child, regardless of the child's background, but he knew that if the fox was going to break free, this would be the crucial moment to stop it. He would do whatever was necessary, carry what burdens may come, and pray Minato forgives him. Bukasaku and Shima concurred with their fellow summons, gathering as much sage energy as possible for Jiraiya to strengthen the sage mode for whatever action he chose to do as well. The infant Naruto, oddly enough didn't seem disturbed at all as the seeming mass, rather apparently watching curiously as the red chakra circulated around him. Finally, the chakra brightened to its maximum, at which the three shinobi turned and shielded their eyes, and a massive red pillar of chakra shot straight into the sky, forcing even the toad and monkey boss to back off. When the glow faded they turned to see the result of this odd occurrence, and for all the training and all the instruction that they've had over the years on maintaining their composure, they all felt their jaws drop. The infant Naruto was still alive, and in good spirits, giggling, and for the most part his appearance was that of a normal newborn child, excluding the nine orange, slightly red-tinted, and white-tipped tails protruding from Naruto's bottom, and the two fox-like ears from the top of his head. Tsunade immediately rushed over and scanned Naruto again, noticing that the child's eyes were also slit and feral looking. Jurei attentively asked. How is he? Everything about him is still fine. Organs, vitals, the works, but this is definitely a new development. The fox's ceiling and chakra must have caused the two to fuse on a deeper level than we had initially thought. Glancing at her teammate and teacher, I need more equipment and a more sterile environment to conduct further tests. Have Hiyashi Hayuga and Anoichi Yamanaka meet me at the hospital ASAP. If the worst case scenario has occurred and that either one or both of them are incapacitated or dead, then bring me any one of their clans that's proficient in the Byakugan and mind walking that also knows how to keep a secret. Also, gather around some surviving ninjas and set up emergency medical tents for all the wounded. I'll help them of course, but this takes priority. Pervert at this Jurea stood at attention. Bring all of the scrolls and records on Minato, then join me there. Old man I'll need you to help run interference against the villagers. Saratobi wasn't offended by the disrespectful manner to which he was addressed. Medical matters were Tsunade's forte, so he would provide whatever she needed. Amabunta standing over the shinobi breathed a heavy sigh of relief. Jurei Gaki, I'm hoping that you have things covered here. That fox kicked the crap out of me, and I'm going to need all the sake in the world to get over this night. Amabunta you can go. Fukasaku, Shima, thanks for all your help. Finally as Shima and her husband detached themselves from Jurei's shoulders, now I can get home and start on dinner. Oh joy Fukasaku drooled, as if that were a plus. This earned him an immediate sucker punch from Shima. Turning to face the shinobi, Gamabunta addressed them, stating. Watch over the child and we all look forward to meeting him when he is of age. Ping Enma turned to them and nodded his assent. With that, the four summons disappeared in a puff of smoke. The remaining three shinobi prepared to set out to the hospital when in a flash Kakashi Haddock arrived. The young, his trademark face mask obscuring his speech, showed signs of battle, yet his trademark face mask miraculously remained unscratched. The fox is gone he asked tentatively. The three seniors nodded. And sensei he added tentatively. Tsuritobi stepped up to the young and silently shook his head. Kakashi started and then realized, seeing the body of his teacher. His head drooped and a single tear rolled down his face from his unconcealed eye. Saratobi laid a hand on the young man's shoulder, young Haddock I understand that it hurts, and we've all lost precious people in this terrible turn of events, but forgive me please when I say that now we must regroup and organize ourselves, and then we may mourn our losses. At this moment I have an important task for you. 
I will understand if you cannot partake it due to your grief, but I implore you not just as Hokage, noting that with this he was officially announcing his retaking of the title, but as a fellow leaf ninja to aid us. Bakashi sniffled once, then bowed before the old Hokage, at your command Hokage-sama. Smiling regrettably, Saratobi stated, track down the two individuals Inoichi and Hiyashi Hayuga. If either happens to be dead or incapacitated, then another of their clan of higher rank may suffice. Tell them that the Sandane Hokage requests their immediate appearance at the hospital in Tsunade's personal office. Although I'm certain that both will attend, tell Hiashi to consider it a late request from Minato. Hi Hokage-sama, but that Kakashi turned to go off but stopped, seeing the infant in Tsunade's arms. He remained paused for a few seconds, staring at the infant's protruding ears and tails, but he also noticed the boy's bright yellow hair and brilliant blue eyes, before regaining his composure disappearing in a flash of wind and leaves. Gureya walked over to the prone body of his student. His head bowed, he opened up a ceiling scroll, bit his thumb, and flashing through some hand signs, the body disappeared in a puff of smoke, stored away into the scroll for preservation until burial. Saratobi and Tsunade quietly bowed during this as well, noting his demeanor, all three paying silent tribute, before starting to the hospital as fast as they could without injuring their precious cargo. The hospital was pure chaos. The injured were innumerable. The sight of the medical slug queen seemed to lift their spirits as much as the Saratobi redonning his hokage hat. The Fort Tsunade could be mobbed by the hospital staff, Saratobi stepped in, raised his hands, and announced, Leaf Shinobi and citizens I implore you, I understand that you are all hurting, and that Tsunade's arrival has brought your hopes up, and I certainly do not want to stop her from assisting you all. But I must ask that you hold on for a little while longer as she must take a priority case of the utmost importance. Hold to your will of fire, and all will be well. Those who could do so raised a fist, and a resounding cheer went up. Unfortunately, the sudden noise had the effect of awakening the infant Naruto sleeping in Tsunade's arms. His sudden crying as a result caused the entire room to go silent. To her credit, Tsunade had covered Naruto with a small cloth to prevent Naruto, and by extension his fox-like features from being seen, but Naruto's fox ears apparently took exception to loud noises, such as crowds cheering, and he cried in response. Shit went through the heads of all three of the senior ninja. To the more experienced incapacitated ninja, or even the inquisitive civilian it would raise unfortunate questions as to why three of the highest ranking ninja of Kanahagakur would be coming back from confronting the fox, directly carrying a baby. Then, as if fate really had it bad for Naruto and the three ninjas, his cries and squirming had dislodged one of his tails from underneath the cloth, exposing it for all to see. If anything the silence in the room had grown more defined. At this Saratobi immediately gestured for his two students to proceed to Tsunade's medical station. Once the two left while trying to placate the distressed Naruto, Saratobi then turned to face the crowd. However this wasn't the kind old man persona that Saratobi generally put up, but rather the idiot Grandpa Aka, the professor and god of shinobi. The look on his face clearly indicated that all present will listen and obey or face the consequences. I won't pretend to not know that all of you saw who, making it clear that it was a person and not a beast or animal, was being carried by Tsunade. At this moment I will only say that he is the hero of this village, and that without him all of us would be dead right now. I must end to him and the rest of my people, yourselves included and then, and only then will I elaborate the circumstances behind what you just witnessed. I also am well aware how fast gossip travels, so mention of this incident to anybody outside of this room will result in dire consequences for both the person who talked and the person who listened. I expect my order on this matter to be followed, am I clear and just to increase the effect, Saratobi let loose a small amount of his killing intent. None of the speechless shinobi said anything. Good dot Saratobi remarked to himself. Now then I will also leave you with the one small basic rule that we all have been instructed with since our academy days, shinobi see what is underneath the underneath dot I suggest that you keep that in mind for both this incident and when I offer my explanation. At that point Kakashi arrived with a battle weary Hiyashi Hayuga and Inoichi Yamanaka. You called for us Hokage-sama. Quickly adopting his sagely old man persona, Saratobi led them in pursuit of his students. When they arrived at Tsunade's office and personal workstation, it was a mess. Scrolls and medicinal records were everywhere, as well as some of Jiraiya's ceiling scrolls and notes. The two individuals in question were standing over an examination table where Naruto lay, burbling happily. Were the two of you able to discern what caused this remark Sandane? No Jiraiya said, gesturing at his notes. Nothing in my notes or Minato's indicates this should have happened to Naruto. Tsunade looked up and saw the two new men stepped up to Hiyashi and Inoichi, who bowed slightly to the dot Inoichi, seemed to recoil slightly upon seeing Naruto, while Hiyashi maintained his stoic nature, but his eyes still widened slightly at the sight. I'm sure the old man has already said what happened to the fox. Continuing she then added, Hiyashi, I need you to look into Naruto and the seal with your Byakugan, and describe what exactly it is you see, including how his chakra is circulating. 
Inoichi, well he does that I need you to go into Naruto's mind and discern whether or not it is the fox in control in any fashion, or whether it's Naruto. Both of you, do not alter or influence anything if you can help it. Describe what you're doing as Jiraiya and I recheck Naruto's biological characteristics and Minato's seal. Lastly, with all due respect, I don't need to tell you what will happen if I, Jiraiya, or Sensei detect any foul play on your parts cracking her knuckles for emphasis. The Ashi stepped forward, I understand, Tsunade Sama and activated his bloodline limit. I see the seal functioning in a secure manner. Naruto's chakra network remains the same as your average humans, I mean persons he corrected himself, but there are additional networks going up into each of his tails, unusually these network filaments appear to be more developed than one would expect in body parts such as these. His chakra is calm at the moment, but there are innumerable minuscule fluctuations of a red chakra, undoubtedly the foxes, constantly flowing through them. The dominant is his with the red mixing in and supporting it. The Hyuga clan head's gaze traveled upwards. His brain is functioning as well as one could expect for a child, but I detect no deficiencies. At that moment Hiyashi's eyes met Naruto's. What was that something caught his notice for a split second? Focusing his Byakugan further, his chakra appears to be flowing to his eyes. It's building up Hiyashi stepped backwards, hand covering his eyes. Tsunade was there instantly, examining his eyes for damage. Fortunately there was none. Rubbing his eyes he reactivated his bloodline and met Naruto's eyes once again, searching for the mysterious phenomenon, but this time on his guard. Naruto's chakra was flowing smoothly with no signs of disturbance. Whatever occurred right then was gone. Looking at the child he couldn't help but think about how much the child resembled his dear departed friend. Inoichi stepped up and gently placed a hand onto Naruto's forehead and began his family's signature dot unsurprisingly to him, he didn't really see anything but a blank white void, with a small sphere in the center, if you could call it that. Inoichi took a closer look and saw images flashing through it, these were the few things that Naruto had seen and heard through the few hours that he was born. He couldn't discern anything coherent though. The images were not flowing smoothly, and the words weren't understandable. Yamanaka smiled, relieved. This was actually what he was hoping for. Naruto, after all, was a newborn child. He didn't have any experiences or enough of an individualistic interpretation on reality in order to form a clear mindscape. Since he had no schooling, no learning behind words and connecting them with images, they would be exactly the gibberish for lack of a better term that he saw. There was no sign of the Kaiubi or a seal, so this meant either one of several things. Naruto was the Kaiubi reincarnated, but with no memories or recordings of its previous existence, or he was the Kaiubi effectively playing dead waiting for a chance to strike, or lastly, that Naruto was an ordinary baby, and that due to the lack of life experience and concrete levels of thinking or imagination, any appearance of the fox would not be apparent until Naruto built up enough life experiences to form a mindscape, at which the fox would appear as a separate but hopifolisled entity. As the Inoichi was about to dispel his he couldn't help but feel as though for one brief second that he was being watched instinctively, he quickly turned his head to see what spooked him, but there was nothing, nothing but the same blank void. Returning to reality the man relayed what he saw to the Inhokage, including the strange paranoia he felt. I saw nothing out of the ordinary that indicates that Naruto wasn't a simple newborn Tsunade Sama. There was no indication that the fox has begun to or has influenced Naruto on a mental level as of yet. It is simply much too early to tell. For all we know the fox may not be influencing Naruto with or without the seal because it can't. It wouldn't be able to do much with an infant body anyway. The only real option is to let Naruto grow up and see how he turns out along the future. Also if I may make a suggestion, Hokage-sama at the elders Nadi continued, Naruto's human characteristics are normal, but I'm uncertain as to how his animalistic features would influence him once he's developed enough. For all we know he could be feral or uncivilized if the fox's general instincts manifest. But that is outside my expertise. You might be better off consulting an Inuzuka or an Aburam, as they would have a better ability for empathizing with their own animal instincts. Saratobi and the others took all this in. Addressing the two clan heads, first and foremost I thank you for taking the time to come and help me with this analysis, despite pressing matters that I'm sure have come up in your own family's recovery. Rest assured you both contributed a huge factor in securing Minato's victory over the Kaiubi. Next I ask that this be classified as an S-class secret, though by the end of this week I've no doubt that you will be hearing rumors regarding this. Lastly, I have one question for the both of you, and I ask that you do not let my status cloud your answer, answer impartially without fear of judgment. The two clans listened intently. How do you view Naruto, as the Kaiubi itself or as a child with an unimaginable burden? There was silence for a few moments. The Ashi spoke first, we Hyuga are provided with being able to see through all, both figuratively and literally. Turning his head at the now sleeping boy, he stared for a few moments, and then back to Saratobi, given what you have told me, Hokage-sama, and what I myself have seen, I do not believe that Naruto is the fox itself. 
The Noichi then spoke his turn, although Naruto's mind displayed none of the characteristics of the fox, for me it is too early to tell as to how he will turn out. I trust your judgment, Hokage-sama, and therefore will maintain an open mind, but I cannot give a reply at this time. Tsuritobi took both their statements in mind. He was glad that Hiashi had more or less given him his support in favor of Naruto, though not without flaunting his clan status, albeit lightly. His respect and friendship with the fourth Hokage would also influence him. He wondered if Hiashi realized the truth. It would however, be tricky for him to extend his favor publicly, given that the Hayuga had its own ruling council within itself, and even he felt they were stuck up. Inoichi, on the other hand, while not outright stating a favorable opinion, was adopting a wait-and-see standpoint, perhaps he'd been hanging around Shikakunara too much, but then again this is true for any person growing up. At the very least he was giving Naruto a chance. Very well, you two are dismissed. The two men bowed, then exited. Okajama Saratobi almost cursed, he'd forgotten that Kakashi was still there. Is there any other task you would like me to do? When he asked this, Saratobi noted that Kakashi kept stealing glances towards the sleeping Naruto. He would have to be told eventually, the old man knew. He owed it to the student of his successor, and felt that if anyone could keep a secret, it would be Kakashi. Head out to the battlefield and help bring in the injured and wounded Saratobi then added, ask Mido Guy to help you. Hi Hokajama and Kakashi vanished in a flash. Turning to his students, the Sandane noticed Jiraiya staring at him with a smirk, clever old man, if anybody can keep Kakashi's mind off of being depressed, it's that crazy spandex obsessed freak. Meanwhile, out on the remnants of the battlefield, a bowl cut hair style gave a cough, then went on ranting about how his youthfulness has caused people to talk about him. Jiraiya sighed and said, so now what? The toad sage, normally vibrant, if in his own, ahem, unique way, was looking very down in spirit, worse than he'd ever been seen. Tsunade looked thoughtful for a moment, then walked over to her bookshelf, pulled out a particularly large volume of what presumably was a medical journal, and opened it revealing a large hidden compartment concealing several large sake bottles. She tossed one to Jiraiya and offered one to Siratobi, who declined, shaking his head at his student's habit. Hey, at least she wasn't a snake cosplayer hunting down boys. Elsewhere, somewhere in the newly created village of sound, said snake began sneezing, then sliced a shinobi who said, bless you in half with his kusanagi. He then added, thank you to each of the halves. monado has gone and the village is a wreck, we've lost a good deal of our military force and civilians from the fox's attack. People are in a panic and we've lost a lot of structural damage. If Monado hadn't done what he did, we would be dead. Changing the subject, the old Hokage asked both his students, what can you tell me about the seal based on Hiashi's and Inoichi's analysis? Gureya spoke up. Monado was a seal genius, and this proves it. The seal allows the Kaiubi's chakra to mix and merge with Naruto's, thus it should give him an almost limitless supply of chakra. The tails and ears were completely unexpected, and thus there's no way to predict this affecting Naruto's future growth, but, the seal for all intents and purposes, is functioning as it should. The fox will not and cannot break free. Tsunade then spoke. I've only seen things like these when I've analyzed the remnants of Orochimaru's sick experiments. Kaiubi's chakra has affected Naruto on what appears to be a genetic level. This also explains the more, ahem pure mixture of chakra, than if the chakra were merely dormant and being called upon at a whim. It's too early to tell, but Naruto will most likely develop heightened abilities such as reflexes and senses as he grows up. However, again it is still too early to tell. An idea came to her, hey pervert, legends have said that there are nine dot has your spy network detected anything regarding other villages sealing bijus, and whether anything like this has happened before. Yeah Jiraiya nodded, but it's been understandably tight. I've heard that I would tried something, and that Suna did something about the Shukaku and oddly enough a tea kettle, but that was years ago. He gained a puzzled expression. The weirdest rumor I've heard about is Kumo have something about a rapping bull octopus across the land, in Kumo. At this, a certain young Kumo Jinchuriki began sneezing, and then being struck by inspiration, whipped out a notepad and wrote, My sneeze is loud, it ain't no breeze oh yeah, only to get smacked by his brother's giant gauntleted arm. Will you shut up with that rapping and get the hell out of my office and for the last time, I will not approve of this stupid proposal that all Kumo Shinobi must undergo a rapping test proctored by you before they get certified. The Rakage then grabbed his brother by the neck and flung him out through the office window, shattering it. The Rakage's secretary only sighed and pressed a speed dial number on her intercom, hello Kumo Glassworks. Yeah, it's Naresha. Yup, the usual order no, this time it was his brother. Okay, see you Tuesday. Thank you. Jiraiya continued, either way I don't know their capabilities or how they reacted to being sealed, and it's not like we can just send a messenger saying, hey, I've got a Jinchuriki who's fused with his demon, has it happened to yours, and any tips for raising him? 
which would be like announcing to the ninja world that we faced a, not just any, but the most powerful, have it contained, and potentially controllable, which would possibly tipping them off that we're vulnerable after the battle, leaving us open to attack, and especially Wagaker, given how Minato decimated their forces during the Third Great Ninja War. And even if they had a lapse in sanity and responded, it only reaffirms what Inoichi basically states, that it's all a case of nature versus nurture. Suratobi finished, looking at Naruto, before shifting to Jiraiya. Jiraiya I know what you promised Minato, yet Konoha is vulnerable right now, maybe more so than we've ever been. What's worse is that if there truly is a deeper meaning behind the Kaiubi's attack, then we need to start looking into it now, while trails may still be fresh. I truly hate to deprive Naruto of someone he'll need, but we need your spy network. I won't ask you to leave, but I'll leave the choice up to you. The Toad San enjoined his sensei in observing Naruto. The resemblance was so uncanny, if one didn't take into account the tails and ears. He couldn't prevent Rachimaru from leaving the village, and now he lost the student that was the closest he'd ever had to his son. What would you tell the village? It's not like he can use it to disguise his appearance as an infant, like our old girl here, earning him a sharp elbow from Tsunade. If I leave, promise me you'll watch over him, old man, because I don't know when I'll be back, but I'll try to make it back by the time he makes Genin or Chunin. Siratobi nodded. Then as if struck by inspiration, he turned to his teammate. Tsunade, could you and Dan adopt Naruto? Tsunade blanched, wah, me. After a moment of consideration, I would have to ask him, but I suppose I could watch over the brat for you. Especially for her as well she trailed off. We've all lost so much, we can at least repay the heroes of this village this way. Ureya then added slyly, just try not to get him into gambling. The vein throbbed in Tsunade's forehead and she growled, oh yeah. If it were up to you, pervert, you'd have him peeking in the hot springs at age 5. Or worse you'd teach him how to read by using one of those books you keep peddling, so don't you dare point fingers at me. Clearing his throat, Suratobi stood up. We will keep his background a secret regrettably he added even from him. Tsunade started to speak up, but then Suratobi continued, telling him is one thing, but whether or not he'll keep it a secret is another. As a child he wouldn't be able to resist telling his background, even if we explicitly told him to keep it a secret. If this gets out we'd have every enemy clamoring for his blood. We'd also have endless fighting between each of the clans on who would get to raise him, or arrange a marriage. He'll have enough problems growing up, we don't need him to know all that has happened until we're sure he can handle it. Should he choose to become a ninja, we'll cross that line when we come to it. Tsunade nodded, seeing the logic. Jiraiya remained silent, though he didn't like the idea of leaving Kanoha so soon, and not doing what he'd promised Minato, it was necessary. I will address the council and village later this week in regards to our victory, my reinstatement in office and coordinating recovery efforts. The three ninja then all focused, addressing the sleeping Naruto, all knowing simultaneously that he would be in for a rough life, but that each one of them promised to be there for him in one form or another. Later that week, the council's chambers were in chaos. Everyone of importance was there, ranging from shinobi, to militaries, to civilians, to merchants. The clans were arguing between themselves about how things should proceed, now that the attack was over, and with Minato being dead. That changed when the doors opened and in walked Suratobi in full Hokage attire, along with his advisors and teammates Hamura and Kaharu. Taking his place before the crowd, Suratobi addressed the crowd. This meeting is called to order. I understand that all have been wondering as to what happened involving Kaiubi's defeat. I apologize for the delay in informing you, but at the same time I thought it wise to give you at least some form of recovery to help your clans and the villages as a whole, gain a foothold in restorative efforts. First and foremost I hereby announce that I reclaim office as the Sandame Hokage, for the immediate, and if necessary, long-term future. I assume that there are no objections. There were cheers and hands clapping and in some of the more strict clans, nods of assent. Second, I will state that yes, Minato was able to defeat the fox, therefore we no longer have to worry about it. Applause broke out, until one voice spoke up and asked, Hokage-sama, please pardon the interruption, but you said, defeated not killed stated Shikaku Nara. Here we go the elderly Hokage grimaced inwardly, he had known that would get picked up on. Yes, I know exactly what I said, and once again you all are entitled to an explanation. He snapped his fingers, and in walked Kakashi, carrying a small bundle, which he then placed on the table and unwrapped, revealing Naruto, fox features and all, to the shocked council. Filling it, especially one as powerful as the fox would have been impossible, even for Minato, therefore he sealed the fox into a child, this child being Naruto Uzumaki. Once again silence met the Hokage's speech. Saratobi studied each face in the crowd, and each held that same measure of being shocked. Well, almost all of them Suratobi definitely saw an almost imperceptible gleam in Danzo's remaining eye. I need to keep an eye on him, pun intended fee. Then pandemonium erupted. If he didn't need to remain a strong and controlled figure he would have face palmed. 
There were shouts ranging from Hokage-sama are you crazy to clamoring over the strength of the seal, to the worst, and what he feared, kill the demon. One suicidal council member pulled out a kunai and flung it at the infant Naruto. The kunai was caught easily by Siratobi, who snapped his fingers again, and in an instant, Kakashi shot forward, Sharingan exposed, hand glowing in electricity, and impaled the poor SOB through the chest. He then reappeared next to Siratobi, standing stoically as if nothing had ever happened, all in the blink of an eye, his victim's blood dripping down his arm, and the council staring horrified at the body. This had the effect of silencing the crowd, as the implications of what had just happened sunk in. Siratobi just used lethal force against a council member. In short, the old man was saying, shut up and listen. At this Saratobi immediately spoke to drive the point home, Naruto is not a demon, or do you doubt Minato's genius? Gesturing at Naruto, the seal's design has altered Naruto's appearance, yes, but the fox has not, repeatedly not taken control of him. Inwardly, the Sandame decided mentioning that Naruto's altered appearance was an unexpected development, would be a very bad idea, last thing he needed to do was give the council any doubts, so he purposely left it out. He should gain access to some of if not all of the fox's abilities as he grows up, at this Saratobi could have sworn that Danzo was one minute from breakdancing in joy, but there is no chance of him becoming the fox either. If you need further proof, my own students Jiraiya and Tsunade have analyzed the seal and Naruto alongside myself, and furthermore, his chakra and mind were observed firsthand by Hiyashi Hayuga and Inoichi Yamanaka. Both said clan heads, nodded and standing, gave brief summaries of their observations, though as per Siratobi's request, they left out the independent anomalies that they each saw. Yugaku Ichiha, however, was infuriated, though it did not show on his outwardly calm face. He was blatantly incensed that the Hokage would call in his clan's immediate rivals and not even consider approaching him for his perspective. To top it all off, Saratobi had the gall to parade Ichihamakuri Kakashi around in front of the council, implying that the Jonin by himself was held in higher regard than his entire clan. This humiliation would not go unanswered in the future. Saratobi then added, furthermore, Minato's last request was that we honor this child as a hero. If he hadn't been born he would not be able to seal the Kaiubi, and for the rest of his life he would have this burden. Okajama. Here it comes Saratobi groaned. This child has unlimited potential as you've implied, and would make a fine weapon for us, especially while we recover from the fox's attack. Let me take the child and raise him in my ranks. Over my cold, dead body you will Saratobi inwardly thought. Outwardly he said with a polite smile, absolutely not Danzo. Naruto will not be raised into a cold, ruthless killing machine, much like your root was placing an emphasis on the past tense of the word. Tsunade of the Sanin has agreed to adopt Naruto, and when he grows up he will be given the same choices that we all had in our growing up. Anzo scowled inwardly at this. I will however say this, from this day forward I forbid talk of the fox's sealing into Naruto. Now obviously his appearance is not something that can be covered up so easily, so I offer this possible explanation instead, state that it is a mutation that manifested itself by chance, which isn't too far from the truth he thought to himself, from chakra emitted by the nine-tailed fox on the day of his birth, if you must bring it up at all. Kami knows that the fox's chakra affected the environment, so it's plausible to have done this to a newborn child. As further proof, as well as a better example to follow, he snapped his fingers, and a pale-skinned young shinobi about Kakashi's age stepped forward. Anbu agent Yamato here, as you all know, has Mokuten abilities. Much like Naruto, he was bestowed them as an infant by an evil force, namely by my infamous student, yet we do not hold him in the same vein as Orochimaru, do we? Nobody in the council refuted this. Then I expect the same to be spoken of by Naruto. Additionally, when the fox attacked Yamato found his powers were slightly influenced, heightened, by its presence. Nothing negative mind you, but this should remove your fears, both in the sense that Yamato can, if need be, suppress the beast, or that our own abilities may even be altered, possibly even for the better. So before you point fingers at Naruto, point them at yourselves. Maybe some of you were altered by the attack, maybe not. Yamato, you are dismissed. The fox is also to be referred to in records as being killed, not defeated or sealed, given that several of you were able to pick up on my word so easily implies that foreign shinobi would be able to do the same, thus is my reasoning for this. Also, as for anybody who is stupid enough to try and harm Naruto, his gaze shifted behind him. At this, Kakashi broke his stoic character, I smiled, held up his bloody hand, and waved politely to the council. Yamato also honored the council with a showing of his infamous ghoul eyes. These are laws that will be punishable by death. Adopting a serene smile. That being said, the matter is now closed, and I propose that we move forward into restoring our village to its pre fox glory. The council all gave looks of affirmation, not wanting to invoke their Hokage's wrath, and additionally another of the Sanin. Arachimaru was bad enough. Saratobi then scanned the crowd as the statistics were taking place, issues discussed, and plans set. Practically all of the civilian members were casting hateful glares at the child. 
The Shinobi Council, for the most part, was the same. And noteworthy few appeared to have something other than hatred on their minds. Chikaku Nara was as usual looking disinterested, but all who knew him figured that if he didn't outright say anything, then he had no grudge. The same could be said for Shibi Aburam, whose only real reaction to Naruto's reveal was a single raised eyebrow. Tsu Minyazuka had a fang smirk on her face. This could either mean one or two things. 1. She was against Naruto and intended to kill him the first chance she got, and considering her clan isn't exactly known for subtly dot. The other is that she was actually amused and glad, because if Naruto did indeed take on Fox characteristics, this would mean that there was other animalistic shinobi that her children may form a kinship with. The Ashihai Uga maintained his ever-stoic demeanor, whereas Fugaku Uchiha allowed himself a furrowed brow and a somewhat slightly condescending face. That aside, few faces aside showed any signs of empathy for Naruto. Even then, Suratobi rationalized that just because a few clan heads such as Hiashi offered their support, didn't guarantee that other individuals would. As an Aburam would say, the village is a hive-minded creature, but each has individual roles, and thus views to show. Saratobi hoped that it would be enough. The rest of the week passed slowly. The village wall that was destroyed by one of the Kyubi's chakra blasts was slowly being rebuilt. The dead that could be reclaimed and identified were given an elaborate ceremony at the end of the week, in which many tears were shed for the loved ones lost. Bonato himself attracted the most grief, as he was so beloved by the village. Jiraiya even broke down crying, while Tsunade and Dan consoled him. Kakashi stood stoically, but inside he was breaking. Mido Gai cried openly, stating that the fourth's flames of youth would never die. Standing tall above the procession was Gamabunta, along with Yugasaku and Shima. Lastly, Naruto was held by Tsunade, and at one point Tsunade took Naruto up to the fourth's casket. Minato was smiling in his eternal sleep. The infant Naruto actually giggled and reached one small grasping hand out towards the body, at this though one couldn't help but notice the eyes on several onlookers darken severely, before Jiraiya and Tsunade took him away. At last Minato's name was forever carved into the memorial stone. Saratobi gave one final speech about pressing forward and remembering Minato for all of his deeds as a shinobi, but foremost for his caring as a friend and teacher. Finally, the body was laid to rest within the Hokage's tomb, along with those of the previous deceased Hokage's. Sadly though certain individuals had promised to be there for Naruto, it would not come to pass as intended. Jiraiya would leave later in the week, with instructions to Saratobi on how to contact him if absolutely necessary, as well as instructions on the conditions and stages of Naruto's seal. Although he stated that he needed to give further support immediately towards his maintaining his spy network, Saratobi could tell that he was still grieving over Minato's death and truly needed time alone to mourn. Anne was overjoyed in regards to Tsunade's agreement to adopt Naruto and was eager to raise him. However tragedy then struck, as within the same week, Dan was killed in action during a mission gone horribly wrong. Tsunade did everything she could to save him, but failed and developed her paralyzing fear of blood. To top it off, at this point, every time she saw Naruto, she was reminded of what she and Dan were to do and just how much that she had lost in her life, her little brother, her teammate, her student, he, and now her lover. Her spirit broken, she departed from the Hidden Leaf Village on an indefinite leave of absence. The one promise she did keep was her promise to her lover's family that Dan's niece, Shizun, would be sent to her when she became of age, in order to be trained as an apprentice. It was believed that Shizun may have been the only link she truly had to Dan that didn't cause her pain. Bakashi buried himself in his work, taking mission after mission after mission, and never giving himself a break. He attempted to teach Jen and teams, but not a single one passed. When asked for an explanation, he would not elaborate beyond saying that the students were lower than trash. With Naruto's foster mother departing, Naruto's fate was left wide in the open. Danzo, ever the opportunist, once again offered his interest in adopting Naruto, but this was stanchly denied by Saratobi. Saratobi instead attempted to adopt him, but the council, which he suspected that Fugaku Uchiha had something to do with, objected, saying that for him to be biased towards one particular child to this extent would be unfair, especially since in his first meeting, Saratobi made it clear that Naruto was to receive equal treatment like any other person. Due to this, Saratobi found himself trapped in the loophole of his own making. He couldn't adopt Naruto without revealing certain information about Naruto, and he couldn't bully the council without arousing suspicion and bringing a threat to the village's social political structure. Saratobi decided to make the best of the situation. He decreed that his laws about the fox's ceiling and Naruto's status still stood, but that Naruto would be placed in Konoha's orphanage, where he may be adopted by any one of Konoha's families. This decision did not sit well with him in the least. Naruto he said, looking at the baby in question, you are in for a rough life. I pray that the will of fire stand strong within you." Naruto Uzumaki sat alone in his room at the Konoha orphanage. He was at his favorite location that is to say beneath the sole window to his room. He hugged his knees up to himself as he recalled his morning. 
The day started as the usual routine. He woke up, got dressed in his shabby clothing, and waited for the door to be unlocked so that he could exit. If he were lucky, he'd get his breakfast without a beating. He'd walk or practically drag his way down the stairs. If he tripped due to injuries, or more frequently, due to a staff member tripping him, then he wasn't helped up at all. Rather, the orphanage staff members would either laugh cruelly at him or mock him. If he was late to breakfast, then he wouldn't get any, or he'd get nothing but bare scraps. He was then herded back up to his room where he was again left alone until lunch, followed by a play period. Though play was used loosely. He was herded out to the backyard only to watch other children play, but never participate, where he then was herded back up to his solitary confinement until dinner, whereupon he then was locked back in his room for sleep. On every other day there was a lesson day for up to four hours. During this time he and the other children were taught to read and ask questions about the world. However, he was always placed in a corner of the classroom, never sat next to anyone, and he was told to sit down and be quiet. Naruto never got to ask questions, but when a question was directed at him and he didn't know the answer he was punished for it. It wasn't fair, and he didn't understand why. One would initially ask why. Why does one child, seven years of age, have to deal with this treatment? One would start at the very beginning with what the public knew of Naruto. Naruto's birthday was October 10, the day of the Kaiubi's defeat and sealing, which is indeed public knowledge to the village's elder generation. As far as anybody knows, Naruto is an orphan, growing up completely alone. Such an occurrence is not entirely unusual. Shinobi have families just like everybody else, but due to the perilous nature of their line of work, it happens frequently that they are killed in the line of battle. Usually if the child belonged to a particular clan then said kin would raise the child instead. Naruto however, had neither parents nor clan. Those who even bothered to question this simply assumed that this particular child's parents had died like so many others in the Kaiubi attack, or at least for those who still saw him as human. Given the fact that it's been specified that the fox was sealed, one would initially think that the obvious conclusion is that Naruto was the container, not the fox. However this was overridden in the public eye, and for the most obvious reason he received such hatred, one merely must take a look at Naruto himself. Naruto looked like your ordinary child for the most part. However, Naruto lacked typical human ears, and instead, two furry orange fox ears protruded from the top of his head, sticking out of a large mop of spiky golden hair that messily traveled down to below his shoulders. His eyes were brilliant blue, but upon closer inspection his pupils were vertically slit, resembling a wild animal's. Adorning each of his cheeks are three thick whisker marks, each one a black color. If Naruto were to open his mouth, one would see elongated, razor-sharp fangs. Traveling lower, Naruto's hands had slightly longer fingernails, razor sharp to a point. The nails on his toes were, like his hands, slightly longer and sharper. Naruto's feet were bare. He had once tried wearing a pair of traditional shinobi sandals that he found in the trash, thinking about how cool it was to mimic the village heroes and play ninja but for whatever reason he found it was extremely uncomfortable and painful for him, as the sandals threw off his balance and walking running coordination badly. The abnormally tough soles of his feet, as well as his claws wore through the shoes faster than he could replace them, so he abandoned them altogether. The most striking thing about Naruto that anybody would outright notice before all else were his tails. Yes, that's right, tails. Protruding from Naruto's bottom were nine long, orange-red with yellowish-white tipped edges, almost a lighter version of the hair on his head. When fully unfurled each one was slightly longer than Naruto at least by half. Naruto could control each appendage individually or as unison. Personally, Naruto thought it was cool. Or at least it had been at first. As far back as he could remember, he'd always had his ears and tails. He asked the old man about them, asking why it had happened and why it looked so different from everyone else around him. The old man would say that he had been gifted with chakra brought about by the Kaiubi attack, but wouldn't go into specifics. It was a long story that Naruto was too young to understand or pay attention to regardless. Besides, Naruto himself hardly saw himself as gifted as time went by. As far back as Naruto could remember his life had been a living hell. Prior to age 6, his memories were a blur, images of the old man were the only things remotely clear and constant to him, he wasn't sure why. He currently lives at an orphanage with other children. But life there wasn't kind to him either. He wasn't allowed to play with any of the toys he saw the other kids playing with. He attempted to ask to play with them many times, but each time either the other kids would either laugh at him tease him by calling him name like Fox Freaker, Fox Boy or other times the matron would intervene scream at him for attempting to corrupt the other children, then throw him into his room and lock the door. When other children would bully him or cruelly prank him, they were praised or rewarded by the staff. Naruto genuinely did appreciate a good prank, never let it be said that he didn't, but if he was getting sick of being pinned down and having his tails glued together or painted or being beaten up, among other things. 
The first time this happened, Naruto did attempt to fight back, and to his surprise, found out that he could stand pretty well against some of the tougher, bigger kids. However, the moment he did, a member of the orphanage staff would appear, kick him to the ground, drag him into his room, and either lock him in a closet or give him the beating of his life. The thing is though, his bruises and scratches would disappear after a few days rest, that is to say, when he got any rest at all, so he gradually just stopped fighting back, curled into a ball, and let the blows rain down. Speaking of his room, it was a threadbare room with only one closet and a dresser. He tended to stay away from the closet, considering how many times he'd been locked into it, he had developed a slight phobia of it. His bed was broken down and was painful to sleep in. Sometimes Naruto would wake up early, leave his room, and return later in the day to find pieces of broken glass, knives, and other presents left concealed among the covers. Nowadays Naruto would disregard the bed completely and curl up on the floor, wrapping his tails around himself like a warm fuzzy blanket, and stare at the night sky through his window until he falls asleep, sometimes crying to himself. In his dreams he'd imagine that he had a family. That he had a kind, beautiful mother who would teach him, laugh with him, just caring for him, and a father who was strong yet gentle, that would play games with him, show him cool stuff and support him. Naruto was clad in a ragged black t-shirt, with numerous holes in it. His shorts weren't much better, being just as ragged, but with a hole in the rear for his tails. This was because the only clothes he'd ever received were ones that had been what he'd find rooting through the trash, or the orphanage staff simply threw him the most filthy attire and did not bother to give him anything else. If one were to look underneath his shirt they'd see Naruto's ribs. He was barely fed, the staff once stating that demons don't deserve good food and gave him scraps or foods that were loaded with items normally associated with the trasher bathroom. One day, a staff member came up to Naruto smiling with a full plate of delicious looking food and said that it was all for him. Naruto was, of course, initially shocked. When he regained his composure, he immediately ran to the man and wrapped his arms around his legs, hugging him and thanking him over and over, in retrospect, he realized that he was so overjoyed that it overridden his noticing how the man tensed when Naruto had hugged him, as well as the odd scent that seemed to come from the food. Naruto took the plate and gorged on it, eating every last drop, thanking Kami for smiling on him for once. However, later that night, his stomach felt funny, and gradually he was overcome with racking spasms and gasps, feeling as though his entire body was on fire. He thought that he was truly going to die and he then passed out. A staff member who'd served him the food then walked in the room in the morning and was shocked, apparently, to see Naruto still alive, but unconscious. Then the staff member dropped his hinge, revealing a red-haired Konoha shinobi. He pulled a kunai and rushed forward attempting to end the life of the fox boy, but as soon as he got within five feet of the boy, a reddish chakra erupted from his prone body and sent out a localized shock wave. Caught off guard by the display, the staff member found himself being blasted clear through the roof. Naruto didn't remember anything else after that, only that when he woke up he was cleaned up, dressed in neater clothes, and was oddly enough, in a brand new cleaner room, with a larger window. This was only a temporary reprieve though, as within the week his room was again laden with surprises. While inspecting his new room, he could have sworn that he saw a man across the street standing on the roof of a building, staring directly at him. The man wore black shinobi gear and had a white face mask. As soon as Naruto blinked, he was gone. Every so often, about a month or so, a time would come where there were visitors to the orphanage looking for children to adopt. Naruto would straighten out what little clothes he had that were the least worn out, comb his hair and tails out with comb he found in the garbage, at least to the best of ability that a seven-year-old had, put on his best smile as he eagerly allowed himself the hope that just once, this once he'd be noticed and taken in by a possible couple. But it never happened. The first time this occurred there was an old man with a funny hat and robes present, who everybody treated with respect and kindness, always saying, Hokage-sama this and Hokage-sama that. Whenever a possible parents came over and saw him, he would feel as though the old man were watching him closely for some reason. The couple, however, would just look at him and immediately glare and ignore him completely. They would also say unflattering things about him when they thought they were out of earshot, either not knowing or caring that his fox ears gave him enhanced hearing, and so he heard every word. This continued with every adoption process, and with each rejection, he'd felt as though a piece of him died inside, and he just wondered why it was that nobody seemed to want him. Oddly enough, after one such rejection, his sharp nose caught the scent of tears. Having known the scent well enough from his own crying he turned his head to find the source, and although he couldn't see for sure, he could have sworn that the scent was coming from the old man. One day, Naruto found himself sitting alone in his new room, staring out the window. Although the room itself was bland, the window did have a nice view of a nearby park. Naruto continued staring, and he watched as other children played there with their parents watching lovingly. His ears twitched as he heard the old man's voice. It seemed quiet at first, then it escalated, and following this he heard footsteps approaching his room, and he turned his head to see who his visitor was. 
Saratobi was livid as he entered the orphanage. With the sheer number of times a child shinobi parents were killed, he made sure that large amounts of money were regularly poured into the orphanage, a policy he started in his first term, and Minato had continued. These children, despite being nameless in a sense, were all a part of Konoha and deserved a chance like anybody else. So why is it that his Anbu tells him one particular child has been sectioned off? Also of note was that said child was Naruto Uzumaki. He was fully aware that people act properly when he or an Anbu or military police member is present, and when he's gone, their true selves emerge. So, every so often, he would send various shinobi under Henge to check up on Naruto. It appears that said shinobi are going to be having a very long talk with him later on. Ironically, it was the lack of anything suspicious for the past couple of years that had led him to question the reports. He couldn't fathom anybody not acting out against Naruto at all, given his condition. Therefore, he hanged himself and did a personal scouting mission and arrived one evening just in time to see one of his own shinobi, the exact one he'd assigned to guard Naruto, come flying through the orphanage roof like a bat out of hell. Tsuritobi apprehended him and then rushed into the room to find an emaciated, nearly dead Naruto, lying in a pool of vomit and other bodily fluids. He immediately enacted first aid on the child and to the hospital. After a little persuading towards the hospital staff, Naruto was given a stomach pump to help clear his system of the poison and drugged to remain unconscious in the hopes that he'd remember it as nothing more than a very bad dream. Saratobi returned to the orphanage and personally inspected Naruto's room and nearly flew off the handle. At this point one of his loyal Anbu arrived with a background check on the orphanage matron. It turned out that she lost her daughter in the Kaiubi attack. Sandane felt himself get sick to his stomach as he knew that more thorough inspections needed to be done on Naruto's caretakers from this point onwards. He had the woman arrested and upon returning to the hospital was told that Naruto had been completely healed but still unconscious due to the Kaiubi's chakra flowing through him. The Sandane carried Naruto back to the orphanage into a clean, larger room, promoted the assistant manager to head, with a strict warning on what would happen if any more incidents occurred, and placed a new guard, a loyal one codenamed Weasel, to watch over him. Now, he was here today, and he's been told that no real progress has been made. Naruto was kept out of interacting with the other children, left out of trips off the orphanage grounds, and still abused regularly. Was there truly nobody who saw Naruto as the hero he was? Saratobi entered the room and saw Naruto sitting on the floor, hugging his knees, ears drooping, and his tails wrapped around him completely. Once again he found himself begging Minato's forgiveness inwardly. Well, with what he had planned today, he could at least try to make amends. Stepping up to the child, he knelt down next to him, slightly wincing as his old bones creaked, and asked kindly, Hello Naruto, how are you today? Naruto jerked, then his eyes shifted up in shock, then his eyes grew cautious, as if expecting a blow or a string of harsh words. Saratobi picked up on this, and out of the corner of his eyes, he saw the newer manager fidget nervously. His fist clenched, and he made a mental note to schedule an appointment with the manager and one Anko Mitarashi. Saratobi turned his attention back to Naruto, and gently held out a hand to the boy, who once again just stared. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity of silence, Naruto spoke, Who are you? Smiling at getting a response, regardless of respect or lack thereof, Will young Naruto Uzumaki, my name is Saratobi Hiruzen. I'm the leader of this village and its people. At the term village, Naruto responded, you mean outside. Narrowing his eyes, Saratobi clarified, yes child. Tell me something Naruto, when was the last time you've been out? I don't remember Naruto replied. Saratobi took a quick overview of Naruto's disheveled appearance and was now seething on the inside. This would stop now. Well Naruto, how would you like to go on a walk with me throughout the village? It is a beautiful day and I happen to have some free time. Naruto continued to stare at him blankly. This man seemed genuine and wasn't exhibiting any noticeable malicious intent that he could detect or smell. Hesitantly, he unwrapped himself and reached his hand out to Saratobi and took it. Gently Saratobi led the boy outside and down the stairs to the exit. In the process, Saratobi stopped by the now drastically nervous manager and released some killing intent on the woman, causing her to faint dead away. The sun was indeed shining brightly today. After much time and rebuilding, the village had structurally prospered and recovered from the attack of the Kaiubi and was flourishing. People walked the streets, saying kind words to each other and exchanging things. Naruto's personality seemed to do a 180 as he stared in wonder, eyes wide. This was his first time truly being outside the orphanage grounds. There were so many sights, sounds and things to see. He darted about excitedly, and his ears twitched as he heard the commotions of the village. His nose took in all the scents around him, and his toes curled as he walked with the sandane through the grass and stone streets. The two walked through the streets. Naruto, too intent on taking in this astounding new environment, constantly asked the Hokage question after question, to which the Hokage would always answer with a smile. 
Naruto seemed to forget the past six years of his life and seemed to be reborn, Sirotobi mused. Being more observant than the child, however, he watched carefully for people's reactions. Unfortunately, people seeing the pair were watching with hate-filled eyes. Evidently they had not yet forgotten the fox's attack and ceiling. However, the presence of the Hokage kept them quiet, and all it took was a stern look from Sirotobi to silence them and prevent them from even thinking about taking action against Naruto. Suddenly, quick as a flash, an Anbu appeared and hailed Sirotobi. Sandame excused himself to Naruto for a moment and spoke quickly with the man. Naruto took in the shinobi's appearance, his boar mask, his katana. And other ninja gear with starry eyes. Naruto's eyes then nearly fell out of their sockets when he saw the shinobi bow before Sirotobi and quite literally run up the wall he was next to, then disappear in a flash of leaves once he reached the roof. Sirotobi took in Naruto's stupefied expression with amusement. The Anbu's news wasn't urgent, just another damned request from another rich merchant attempting to arrange a meeting just so he could be a royal suck-up. Sorry about the interruption Naruto, where were we getting no response, he saw Naruto staring after the Anbu, mouth hanging wide open, then gently poked at Naruto's shoulder and finally got a response. Wow Naruto was a flutter with excitement. How'd he do that old man? That was so cool. He was a ninja or shinobi Naruto. As I am Hokage, all shinobi and Kanahagakure answered to me. So Naruto's face scrunched up as he contemplated this. That means you're a really strong old man. But you don't look like it, you're so old. Sirotobi's eye twitched at this, but he kept up his smile. One thing that a shinobi must keep in mind is deception. For example on the outside I may appear to be a harmless old man as you so politely put it, but to be old, one has to have been young. I've lived through many battles and what I may lack in stature right now, I assure you that I possess experience. Now, shall we continue our walk? Nodding, Naruto started to walk, then abruptly stopped in his exploration. He stopped, closed his eyes, and started sniffing experimentally, his tails relaxing, Saratobi stopping and simply observing this phenomenon. Suddenly, his tail straightened out, and Naruto shot off like a rocket. Saratobi found himself increasing his pace slightly to keep up. Naruto, what is it? Something smells great old man, I gotta find out what it is. He kept up his sniffing, stopping only to close his eyes and concentrate on his nose some more. Hmm, interesting, already at this young age I'd reckon that his nose is just as sharp as an Inuzuka's. Finally, Naruto stopped and stared up at a small ramen shop and focused on the sign, Ichiiki, he dictated to himself. Saratobi stopped next to him. Naruto asked, pointing at the sign, what's it say old man? Saratobi felt just one more strike against the orphanage. Forget Ibiki or Anko, at this rate he'd be sending the entire staff to Orochimaru in a gift-wrapped box. Naruto at least was somewhat literate, he thought to himself, that was a plus, but he should have been well above the level that he'd observed today. Smiling, he said, it says Ichiraku Raymond Naruto. Have you ever had Raymond before, Naruto at this Naruto's ears and tails drooped. No old man, I really haven't eaten much, ever. Naruto, come closer. Siratobi did a basic medical analysis and saw that for all his excitement, Naruto was practically skin and bones, despite his orders for the orphanage to treat him better. That's it, the witch is getting the death penalty, and I'll do the job myself. Well then, how about we have a little lunch here, my treat Naruto immediately cheered up. Saratobi gently lifted Naruto up to a stool, and then sat down next to him. Yes, how can I help Hokage-sama the chef, Tuchi, exclaimed, how may I serve you sir? Holding up a hand, Saratobi chuckled and said, please friend, no need for formalities. I'm just here with my little friend here he said, gesturing at Naruto. Naruto peered up meekly from his seat at the chef. Gucci didn't even blink at Naruto's appearance, he just gave Naruto a genuine smile. Well then what's your name son? Nar Naruto Uzumaki Sir Naruto stuttered slightly. Okay Naruto, what would you like since this is your first time here, I'll give you anything you want in the house. Naruto brightened, first one then two people to not treat him like a freak of nature. He smiled and started to speak when he realized he had no idea on what to order. He glanced at a menu on the counter but found that he couldn't decide. Gucci, figuring out what was wrong, simply chuckled good-naturedly and said, try the Maizo Raymond Naruto, it's one of my foremost specialties. Startled, Naruto simply nodded. The chef then took Saratobi's order and started to prepare the meal. As he did, a young girl about 13 years of age walked out of the back of the shop, struggling slightly with a large box. Dad, I got the extra noodles, where do you want them? Next to the stove, on top of the crate am. Ah, where are my manners, am, you know my old friend the Hokage, right? He's brought a new friend and customer for us. I'd like you to meet Naruto Uzumaki. The girl peered over the counter at Naruto, and suddenly Naruto found himself bowled over by the squealing teen, sparkles in her eyes. Kawei. Your ears and tails are so woody. She pulled on said extremities and bombarded Naruto with a slew of questions about them. Naruto just lay back on the floor where he landed in shock. 
This was the first time that anybody had ever spoken positively about his fox features. Naruto remained in shock while her father, laughing hilariously, managed to rush out, grab his squealing hysterical daughter, who still had stars in her eyes, and drag her back into the shop, barely managing to shove her behind the door leading up to their apartment and barricading it with a chair. Aha, sorry about that Naruto, she has a weakness for anything she perceives as cutie sweat dropped. Naruto seemed to recover from the shock and climbed back up to his stool, though he was still in a daze. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity to Naruto, Tucci presented the two with their bowls of ramen. Naruto glanced down at the bowl in front of him and hesitantly glanced at the Hokage, who nodded. Naruto picked up the bowl, lifted it to his mouth, and took an experimental sip of the broth. It was like the flavor flooded into his body like a tsunami. Naruto immediately guzzled the ramen down, soup, noodles, pork and all in under 10 seconds. Saratobi himself was shocked at how fast it was gone. Then, remembering how little Naruto had eaten, he leaned over to Tucci and whispered, I think he's hooked, my friend. You better let your daughter out and have her back you up. By the way, I believe it was you who said it was, on the house. Saratobi then took out the amount for his serving of Raymond and laid it on the counter for Tucci and sat back with a satisfied smirk. One hour later, Naruto had gone through whooping 25 bowls of adult-sized Raymond bowls. Tucci and A.M., who managed to rein in her cuteness obsession meter, looked like they were on the verge of heart attacks, and empty Raymond boxes littered the floor of their shop in massive piles. Sorotobi still was staring bemusedly, remembering how this scene reminded him of a certain someone. Finally, Naruto finished his last bowl, set it down, and released a massive satisfied belch that Sorotobi could swore would have been hurt all the way in Suna. Despite ingesting several times his body weight, Naruto wasn't sluggish, he instead leaped up onto the counter, heedless of his feet tracking it, grabbed Tucci's hand, and started pumping it rapidly. Thank you Tucci-san and AM-san, so much. I've never had such a great meal before. Tucci stared blankly at the empty Raymond bowl surrounding his counter hello. Tucci-san. Old man Naruto panicked, I think something's wrong with him. Saratobi nearly broke down in hysterics. He's alright Naruto. I just think you overwhelmed him a bit at this Tucci finally seemed to recover. No problem Naruto. Wow. I've almost, Saratobi cleared his throat. I mean, I've never seen anybody consume that much Raymond in one sitting before. I think I'm going to close shop for the rest of the day and take the weekend off. Seeing Naruto's dismayed expression, Tucci laughed heartily, regaining his composure. Naruto had to set a world record for Raymond eating. Tell you what, since you loved my Raymond so much, I'll give you a special deal. Once a month, you'll get to have free Raymond for a single day. I'd love to give you this deal every day, but if today were any indication, you'd eat us out of business. Naruto brightened up, but then dropped as he remembered something, thanks Tuchi-san, but I don't have any money, so you probably won't see me at much. Tsuritobi said, Naruto, I actually came up with something for you. I'll give you a monthly allowance that will allow money for food, clothing and essentials. Naruto cheered up at this. Now before you say anything else Naruto, I have one final surprise for you. Tucci, AM, thank you for the delicious meal. Tucci waved them off as he attempted to revive his still comatose daughter. Apparently the combination of Naruto's cuteness and the record-breaking amount of ramen he'd eaten had been too much for her. Saratobi decided on a different course instead of walking to their destination, so he picked Naruto up and placed the happy child on his shoulders, carrying the boy, Naruto's tails draping down his back. Now hold on tight he advised Naruto. In a flash, Saratobi, the environments and people passing by in a blur. When they stopped, Saratobi gently set Naruto down. Naruto was silent, eyes wide, and mouth gaping open. He tentatively took a step, teetered, then collapsed on the grassy lawn of their destination, his tails draped all over him. In a moment though, he got back up and was tugging frantically at Sandame's ropes. How'd you do that old man? Show me. Show me. Show me. In time Dorito Saratobi said, raising his hands to placate the child. Now then, shall we go in? We're old man. Your new home he said gesturing at the small apartment complex in front of them. Entering the door, they climbed a flight of stairs and stopped in front of a second floor door. Taking a key out of his robes, Saratobi opened the door, and the two entered. Naruto stared around speechless. The apartment was a tidy little place. It was neat and clean, with a kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, and living room. Is this all for me he asked. Yes Naruto, this is all yours. You never have to go back to the orphanage again. You'll find that the fridge is completely stocked, and you have clean equipment such as sheets and towels, and I also had some custom clothing made for you, he said, gesturing at the closet. Naruto stared, taking all this in, and then his ears and tails drooped, and he started crying tears streaming down his face. Saratobi stooped down and embraced the child gently. I'm sorry Naruto, I'm so sorry Minato and Kishina that I cannot do more he thought to himself. Saratobi spent the next hour helping instruct Naruto on the safe usage of the utilities. 
Finally, when he turned to leave, he saw that Naruto had fallen asleep after a hyperactive session of jumping on his new bed, his tails wrapped around him. Saratobi smiled to himself, then turned to leave. Before he stepped out the bedroom door, he paused as a thought passed through his head. He flashed through a short sequence of hand signs and activated a hinge. In a puff of smoke, the aged form of Harazan Saratobi no longer stood there, but rather, the young visage of Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage. The hanged Hokage stood over Naruto's exhausted form and leaned over him, whispering in Minato's voice, Be strong my son never giving up, and I'll always love you and be watching over you. He then walked out of the room and apartment, locking the door behind him as he dispelled the hinge in a way. Naruto began this new phase of his life with renewed vigor. Taking the stroll through the village with Saratobi had opened his eyes to new possibilities. He woke up this morning, unwrapped himself from his tails, and once again explored his new apartment. He took down the clean-smelling scent and the feel of the place. Naruto padded into the bathroom and took a nice long bath, splashing around in the tub, then wrapped a towel around himself as he headed into the kitchen. Opening the cabinet, he stared quizzically as he attempted to remember what the old man said. Fortunately, Saratobi had taken into account Naruto's limited reading skills and placed a simple note with several arrows placed on each of the items, Naruto was able to make himself cereal for breakfast and actually make several bowls. It was an okay meal, he thought. It still didn't beat Raymond though. He sat in his chair and wondered what he should do next. Then it came to him, he'll go out exploring. He and the old man were only out for a short time yesterday. He couldn't wait to see what he could encounter on his own. Naruto ran to his closet and then stopped abruptly. Images flashed through his head and he remembered all the times he'd been locked inside one at his orphanage, cold and alone, uncertain as to when or if he'd ever be let out. Naruto looked down at his hands and saw that they were trembling. He then growled to himself, deciding not to be afraid. After all, things were finally looking up for him and he ripped the door open, using far more force than one would expect from a child of his age. Inside he saw several pairs of uniforms, mostly being everyday attire, but customized so that his tails could stick out. He saw a few hats and also some robes and underwear as well. He saw a few pairs of sandals on the floor, but he disregarded them, recalling that he hated wearing them anyway. Edding dress Naruto ran up to the window and peered outside and saw that it was just as beautiful as it was yesterday. A wide smile adorning his face, he grabbed his keys and stepped out his door, locking it as he went. Naruto ran down the stairs and out through the door. He started again at the crowds as he nervously fingered the money in his pocket. He stepped out and started walking in no particular direction. As he did, he couldn't help but notice how quiet it became. It was as if all the people stopped immediately what they were doing and started staring at him. Naruto became slightly unnerved but still continued, a bright smile on his face, which had the unfortunate habit of baring his fangs. His ears twitched and he found that he was hearing some of the people's conversations. Look, it has appeared. It's mocking us, I mean look at it. It knows that it's still alive while we've lost so much. How can the Hokage allow it to just live and what's worse, cater to the beast? Damn demon should have died the moment he'd reincarnated himself. Naruto didn't understand who was a demon. And why was everybody looking at him like that? He continued on until his nose picked up the scent of something very sweet. Given how it led him to the wondrous discovery of Raymond yesterday, he believed that his sense of smell had once again come to his aid. Excited, Naruto dashed forward, searching with both eyes and nose. To him, he was moving so fast that he couldn't hear the odd whispers, all his sensitive ears could pick up was the wind rushing through them. The scent led him to a small cart, reading the sign, it stated, cotton candy and a small minuscule price. Naruto saw several children and their parents purchasing some in a line. Smiling in anticipation, Naruto skipped up behind the last person and eagerly waited his turn. However, when the latest child to get their candy received it, he noticed Naruto, tugging on his father's pants leg, he pointed at Naruto and asked him something. The boy's father took one look at Naruto, glared, took his son's hand, and hurriedly walked away. This then set off a chain reaction, as each further person in line saw Naruto and stepped away quickly, in some cases apologizing to their now crying children and promising them something else as compensation, and Naruto found himself at the front of the line. The card's owner was puzzled, trying to figure out what caused all of his customers to just run out. A small voice called out, can I have one please looking down, he saw a smiling young boy with fox ears and nine large tails. The gears started turning in his head and then he realized what happened. Furiously, he glared and screamed, you. You've got some nerve here demon. First you terrorize my customers and now you have the gall to try to take some of my wares. Naruto, petrified at the sudden shift in mood, took a step back and shaking, reached into his pocket and pulled out some coins. To have some money sir, I wasn't trying to cause any trouble. The storekeeper gave a sadistic smile. Ha. Is this some kind of sick joke, you scare away my customers and now you expect me to let that slide. 
You owe me for all that I would have sold if you hadn't shown your ugly face here. Leaning forward, he grabbed the terrified Naruto by the front of his shirt, reached into his pocket, and took all of Naruto's money. He then dropped Naruto unceremoniously onto the hard ground in a heap and shouted, get out of my sight, and don't you ever come back. Rearing his leg back, he gave Naruto an absolute vicious kick to the ribs noteworthy of a pro soccer player, sending the poor boy sprawling several feet away. The crowd that had gathered, watching this scene then started cheering, clapping the man on his back, and thanking him for putting the demon in his place. Encouraged by this, the owner walked forward and stomped painfully on Naruto's leg, breaking it with a sickening snap. Naruto screamed in agony, tears streaming down his face. The owner then spit on Naruto's crying face and turned around, gathered up his cart and supplies, and stalked away. Naruto lay there crying. It hurt badly to move and breathe, and he started coughing, heaving a few spots of blood. More importantly, he asked himself why. This wasn't at the orphanage, so why was he treated this way? People didn't hurt him yesterday when he was out with the old man. More tears streamed down his face as he scanned the crowd. There was no other emotion other than hatred, condensation, or sick satisfaction in seeing him suffer. Sadly realizing he would get no help here, Naruto started to drag himself into a nearby corner to attract as little attention as possible. Each time he moved the wrong way, spasms of excruciating pain would travel up his leg. Finally, Naruto leaned up against a wall, panting and hacking painfully. He wasn't sure how long he lay there, but he must have blacked out, because when he opened his eyes last, it was dark at night. He coughed once, then realizing that he was no longer spitting up blood. Gingerly, he gripped onto a wall with his finger claws and started to pull himself up to his feet. He gently set the foot of his damaged leg on the ground and nearly collapsed, stumbling completely to the ground in pain. The pain was only slightly less than it was earlier, so it would not be wise to try walking on it. Laying a small wooden board, Naruto carefully dragged himself over to it, then propping himself up on said board, started using it as a makeshift crutch. As he hobbled back to his apartment dragging his tails behind him, he felt miserable. His mood brightened a bit when he saw a small clinic down the street. Maybe they'd help him, no such luck. The second Naruto stepped into the clinic, the secretary and doctor screamed at him for allegedly contaminating the clinic and Naruto found himself being forcibly ejected from the premises. Naruto was again sprawled out on the ground, his legs break being exacerbated by the fall. Naruto just stared blankly at the ground, his eyes turned back to the board he'd use as a crutch, only to find that the secretary had snapped it in half so that he couldn't use it. Silently, Naruto literally dragged himself home amid the glares and mocking stares up the stairs, the only plus about the situation is that he found he could use his tails to grip things or brace himself, one agonizing step at a time, and upon reaching his front door, found that a message written in blood stating, die demon die had been written all over the once pristine surface. Once inside, Naruto collapsed against a wall and wrapped his tail around himself, using one of them to brace his injured leg. Fearfully, at this point Naruto came to one important realization. He was alone. There was nobody here to greet him, to ask him how his day was, to smile and hold him. He wrapped his tails tighter around himself, maybe next time I go out, things will be better he hoped. It took about a week and a half for Naruto's leg and chest to heal. In that time he largely felt depressed and bored out of his mind being cooped up inside. Saratobi had stopped by once to see how Naruto was doing, became disgusted at the sight of the obscene message written on the door, and then nearly had a heart attack when he saw that Naruto's leg had suddenly gained new joints. He immediately checked it out, sent an anbu to retrieve a medic. Said medic scanned Naruto's injuries, set his leg with a splint, and thankfully informed Sandame that the injuries showed unbelievable recovery. A break like this would normally take a few months to heal, but Naruto should be fine in about 11 days. To cheer him up, Saratobi sent one of his ambus, this one having odd gray hair and a dog mask, over to retrieve a takeout box of Ichiraku Raymond. While Naruto waited for his leg to heal, adapted rather well, being able to use his good leg and tails to help manipulate objects that were out of his reach. An anbu, a dog or raccoon mask shinobi would come by and make him his meals, then quickly depart. The next few days it rained moderately. On occasion, he would see Dog as he came to call him, standing or sitting across the street on a roof watching his apartment, apparently not bothered by the weather. Sometimes he had an odd orange book in his hand. Naruto would wave at the Anbu, who would occasionally either give a slight wave back or disappear in the blink of an eye to a less conspicuous location. The day he was fully healed, the medic returned, and under Dog's watchful eye, he removed the splint. The moment it was off, Naruto was off like a rocket, cheering and zooming all over his apartment, despite both Dog and the medic's distressed shouts that he had taken it easy. The medic left after taking a few tests and pronouncing Naruto fully recovered. Dog left too, vanishing in a flash which Naruto stared at wide-eyed. Following Dog's end, which incidentally smelled like his nickname, he dashed over to his open window and saw the Anbu vaulting over rooftops towards the Hokage's tower. 
Naruto was starry-eyed. That was so cool. This got him thinking. The old man said that Shinobi could do all the cool stuff like run really fast and up walls. Recalling how the old man stated that Konoha was a ninja village he made his decision, he would try to be a ninja. Then he would be able to do all the cool stuff. Naruto dashed out his door and onto the roof of his building. He glanced over the edge, looked at the building he'd seen Dog heading towards. Fortunately, the sheer size of the gap and drop activated Naruto's self-preservation instinct and wisely guided him to choose a closer landing spot, namely the building next to his which was about 10 feet away. A.N. It helps if you imagine the first Spider-Man film while reading this next part. Backing up, Naruto took a deep breath and started running. He increased his speed, reached the edge and leapt. He whooped his sword across the distance. As soon as he touched down though, his foot slipped on a puddle left over from yesterday's rain and went tumbling head over tails over heels. Stars appeared before Naruto's eyes as he suddenly wondered why everything was suddenly upside down, his tails falling in his face. Riding himself, he huffed a bit proudly. He'd done it. Full of excitement, Naruto ran back across and repeated the leap, but this time he held back slightly in his leap, not wanting to mess up his landing. This action however, didn't give him enough height to make it across the gap. Oh crap Naruto thought, using an expletive he'd heard from an adult. He flailed his arms about as his momentum carried himself closer and closer to the wall. He hit the wall with a thud, resembling a bug on a windshield, and then he started to fall. Naruto grasped frantically to find some purchase in the wall, when suddenly his fall stopped. Coming down, he saw that the claws on his hands and toes dug into the surface, arresting his descent. Hesitantly, Naruto started pulling himself up a few steps, then hung there, his claws supporting him. Awesome Naruto shouted. However, in his exclamation, the process of which he'd thrown up his hands in joy, he'd removed his finger claws from the wall. Oh crap Naruto thought again as he found himself swinging backwards. His toe claws were pulled out by the sudden shift in posture, and with a loud thud he hit the ground. Yes, the ground. You see, when Naruto first realized that he could climb walls in order to stop himself from falling, he had actually arrested his fall at about roughly 5 feet above the ground. He simply hadn't realized it because he was too wrapped up in his new discovery. Laying there in confusion Naruto waited for his head to stop throbbing, sat up and looked at his claws. He walked right up to the wall, placed his hands onto it, dug into it with his hand, then toe claws and slowly but surely began to scale the wall once again. It was a trial and error process, and ironically, it never occurred to Naruto that it took normal shinobi years of strength training to be able to dig into surfaces like that. Every so often, Naruto would find that if he didn't stick his claws in the right way, then they would slip out and he'd lose purchase. Eventually he managed to work out a system. While his feet would support his body's position, his hands would reach upwards and find new perches for him to ascend. Naruto finally reached the top and once again whooped in joy, then collapsed in a pool of sweat, exhausted. Now he could be like dog. Naruto spent the rest of the day practicing his leaps and climbing. Along the way he made a few very important discoveries. For example, even the calm professional Kinoichi will fly completely off the handle if you climb the side of a building and out of sheer curiosity, happen to look into a window and accidentally see them changing, except for the crazy purple-haired one who asked him if he got a good enough look. Equally odd was the fact that she smelled like snakes. Another was that he couldn't climb metal walls, at least not yet. He could stick his claws into them and instead only manage to accidentally rake his claws down them, resulting in the most ear-splittingly painful screech that he'd ever heard, causing him to fall to the ground and clamp his hands over his overly sensitive ears. When he finally managed to get up, ears still ringing, he resolved to never do that again. Lastly, by moving his tails in mid-flight, he could actually alter the trajectory of his leap slightly or twist about in mid-air. Naruto's rooftop antics didn't go unnoticed. Several pedestrians below heard his whoops and hollers. Of course, most of them weren't shinobi who simply thought to look up, so all they heard was the noise, looked about in bewilderment, and continued about their daily business. Shinobi that were either on or off duty however, did see him. Those who were on duty settled to merely disregard him with glaring hostility. One Anbu, codenamed Turtle looked around to make sure nobody was watching to break his on-duty persona, then ranted on Naruto's exuberant flames of youth before getting back in character. Eventually Naruto stopped to take a break, huffing and puffing from his exertions. Dangling his feet over the edge, he simply stared at the sky for a few moments. He didn't know why, but he had a sudden urge to say, troublesome dot his stomach growled loudly and glanced at it in embarrassment. All the running, jumping and climbing he'd done was certainly demanding. Naruto decided to pursue something to satiate his hunger. Shuddering at the memory of last week's event, he decided to stay away from any cotton candy stands. Climbing down from his perch to the ground, Naruto again trusted his nose, which led him to a large Korean barbecue restaurant. Drooling at the smell of meat, Naruto found himself pressing his face up against the window. 
he almost wished he hadn't. Inside the restaurant he saw so many individuals and families eating happily. One table hosted a large group of, ahem, big bone people that were putting away food faster than he put away Raymon, much to the bemusement of their lazy looking fellows. Naruto then felt a different kind of pang, and he almost lost his appetite. He continued to stare, wishing that he could be the kid in that family. He watched as he continued stuffing his face and saw his lazy pineapple-haired friend sitting next to him, only to get slapped upside the head by a domineering-looking woman. Naruto winced, knowing what it was like to be hit, but then he saw that kid's father laughing, only to get smacked as well, and then whole table erupted in mirth, clarifying to Naruto that the blows delivers weren't meant to be a form of punishment, but oddly enough, caring. Naruto stood so engrossed in the scene that he didn't hear footsteps approaching until the last minute, only to turn and see a large frying pan come flying over towards his face. The impact knocked him on his side, as one of the restaurant's chefs came over from dumping out trash, and shouted, get out of here you damn demon it will be a cold day in hell before we serve your kind here. He then flung a butcher's knife right at poor Naruto. Naruto, already on edge from his earlier acrobatics, managed to dodge it for the most part. Instead the knife's blade nicked him in his left arm, leaving a gash. Naruto turned and ran as fast as he could. He ran as fast as he could, shoved his way in and out of crowds and mobs shouting and throwing things at him, until he reached his apartment. Unconsciously, he dashed at full speed, and actually ran up the wall without chakra, thanks to his toe claws. He charged into his apartment, ran straight into his room, collapsed into his bed, burying his face into a pillow, wrapped up in his tails, and sobbed his little heart out at the unfairness of it all. The days continued like that. Naruto would try and try to explore Konoha, only to either get attacked or ridiculed. Nobody sold him any goods, save for a direct few, and aside from Ichirakus, everybody charged him ludicrous prices. The only time he truly enjoyed himself was when he was out running, climbing or practicing his agility with his tails. Sure, he often woke up sore all over, but it was worth it. The old man visited him to check up on him, but his visits were too few in between. Here dog or turtle would sometimes bring him groceries. But regardless it never beats Raymond. Naruto was pacing about, practically wearing out a hole in the floor of his apartment, hands in his pockets, tails flapping absently behind him in irritancy. The old man told him that today was his birthday, and that thus was a happy day of celebration. However, Saratobi was no fool and asked Naruto to stay in his apartment the entire day. When he asked why, Saratobi merely dodged the question with a promise to treat Naruto to an all-you-can-eat Raymond trip the next day, to which Naruto immediately complied, his ears and tails perking up, and he promised not to leave his dwelling. The day was known as the Kaiubi Festival, a day of celebration of its defeat and a day of remembrance, for all the lives lost, especially that of the beloved 4th Hokage. Almost everybody had the day off, save for some essential guards, who were even given rotational shifts, so that they too may participate in the festivities. Tsuritobi's presence was required, as he gave a heartfelt speech about the great battle, and had his own family to take there. Naruto didn't know any of this though. He'd never had a real birthday party. He overheard in some areas that birthdays were apparently supposed to be happy occasions, with friends, family, and treats. All he knew was that on one particular day of the year, the orphanage staff was harsher on him, either locking him in a closet the entire day, starving him, or being even more vicious in beatings. At nights though, he'd watch from his window all of the fireworks, his sensitive ears heard all the sounds of joyous celebration, and he'd smelled so many delicious scents. As the evening grew on, the temptation of just joining in on the party grew and grew. He wasn't locked up in his room like at the orphanage, and he could see, hear, and smell more and more. Despite all that happened to him over the past few weeks, he still held hope that he could participate, maybe even make a friend, and still be back in time before the old man returned. Finally his mind was made up. Naruto dashed off his balcony and leapt clear over it. The second his claws latched onto the neighboring wall he scurried down it until his feet touched bottom. His eyes widened as he stepped into the streets. Everything looked so pretty. One thing that he'd noticed was orange. Everything that could be worn hung or waved was orange. Torches lit the streets as people laughed, laughed, danced, and played. He also saw stylized paintings and posters depicting a man battling a large fox. It looked so cool. He traveled further down, and people at vending stands even gave him free samples. Eventually he saw some kids his age playing, and, eager to introduce himself, he darted forward. Ironically, although Naruto himself didn't realize this, his orange t-shirt, ears, and tails, gave him a type of camouflage among the environment. To anybody who merely glanced at him for a second, they would only see what they believed to be a small child dressing up in a rather convincing costume. Naruto rushed forward, getting the attention of one of the kids and introduced himself. Hi my name's Naruto, what's yours? The other kid stared at him, taking in his appearance, then simply shrugged, dismissing it as a costume, and responded, name's Kurin. Naruto then noticed that he, and pretty much everybody nearby was dressed in costumes. 
butts with the costumes Naruto asked excitedly, hoping that whatever it was, he could join in. Oh, we're just dressing up for the festival. He gestured at some of the other kids in the area. Most were dressed as either the fourth Hokage, one of the two legends that participated in the battle. Some were even dressed as the Toad Boss Gamabunta. A few were dressed as the Kai Ubi and held mock battles against those dressed as the fourth Hokage. Naruto thought it was all so cool. He stared starry eyed at the costumes, especially the replicas of the fourth's famous flame lined cloak. Glancing around, he suddenly spotted one said jacket lying on the ground, apparently left behind and forgotten by its original owner. His eyes bugged out, and he looked to his left and right to ensure that there was nobody there who was returning to possibly reclaim their no his jacket. He dashed forward and picked it up. Yes, he knew it was a cheap replica, but to him, it may as well be made out of gold. He slipped it on, and to his delight, it actually fit. Well, save for his tail sticking out from underneath the cloak. He then started mimicking all the super cool moves he'd seen ninjas acting out, from tossing kunai to some clumsily executed kicks. Naruto was overjoyed. And the best part is that he seemed to fit right in. Nobody was shouting names at him nor attacking him. He followed the procession a bit, enjoying some of the sights. Unbeknownst to Naruto, he'd actually stumbled into a prelim for one of many contests being held around Konoha, in which the most realistic resemblance to the person or scene being depicted would win a prize. Naruto innocently followed the group and noticed three adults looking over each contestant, judging them. One was a shinobi in his late 40s, another a civilian who looked to be about 25 or so, and the last one was another man roughly 30. Finally, it apparently was his turn, as one of the judges gestured for him to come forward. Smiling with glee, Naruto eagerly stepped forward. The judges each raised an eyebrow at Naruto's costume and began conversing amongst themselves. Unique costume, I can't quite see the point of combining the image of the fourth and the Kaiubi, but I admit it's the first of its kind. Maybe he's trying to show that the fourth was superior over the fox, or smart as a fox as the saying goes, more so than the Kaiubi. Perhaps, but I do think that we can agree that the resemblance of the fourth Hokage is the best we've seen so far, well minus the fox ears. Then it's agreed. Yes I think we have a winner for the prelims. I agree turning to Naruto, the judge said, okay son, congratulations, you win the prelims. I won. Yes. Naruto started doing his little victory dance. The judge spoke up again, by the way son, we need to know your name. Naruto couldn't be happier to reply, Naruto Uzumaki sir. Meanwhile, Tsuritobi was in a mixed mood right now. On the one hand, the Kaiubi festival was a happy time of reflection for the villagers. They were able to vent and release some of the lingering feelings in a responsible, safe manner. He could not, would not ask them to not celebrate. On the other hand, the one person who should have been there and honored above all else wasn't. Naruto could not attend this ceremony, or for that matter, any ceremony in the reasonable future, especially given how the villagers normally reacted to him. It was a load of bull, and Suratobi knew it. The sand aim had been making his rounds during the festival. He had his speech written out and in one of his robe's pockets. Nothing extraordinary, just the usual, blah blah blah, the Kaiubi attack, blah blah, the fourth defeated it, blah blah, today's a day of celebration and remembrance. Of course, he did not in any way denounce the sacrifices of those lost, but at times he'd like to say what he really thought, namely that Minato would be ashamed that the village didn't honor his last wish. His son Asuma was out of the village with the guardians, while his daughter was out with her husband with their toddler Kanohimaru. Finally, after making all of his required appearances the Sandane judged the last event, that being the costume part. As he did so, he couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had happened. He at first dismissed it as mere paranoia, but when it resurfaced, then he took it seriously, after all, decades of being a shinobi had taught him that your instincts can mean the difference between life and death. He scanned the crowd and then met up with the three preliminary judges. They had been selected for their differing perspectives. Hiroki, the oldest, was a who was also a veteran of the Kaiubi attack, having witnessed both firsthand how devastating the event was. The second was a civilian named Shira. She was born a few years before the attack, but fortunately her family survived with no deaths. The final was Mitsuro, who tragically had lost his beloved wife in the attack. One might question why these three were chosen to judge such a contest, given the emotional baggage. The reasoning was to get the most accurate judgment the ones who were best suited were those who were involved directly in the attack. The three also had each felt honored to be chosen, and so presumably had moved on despite their personal tragedy. Shira's perspective offered that one indirect judgment in order to provide balance. Tsuritobi greeted the three, shaking their hands. In the process he noticed that there was a notable number of odd orange and yellow strands on Hiroki's vest, despite Hiroki being predominantly black-haired with some gray showing a little. Tsuritobi dismissed it as nothing though, seeing as orange was the decorative color of the day, and figured that Hiroki merely brushed up against a banner or something. Outwardly though, he still could not figure out what was bothering him so much. 
He looked up and down the row of winners and finally selected the winner, a young boy who had donned a convincing blonde wig and cloak reminiscent of the fourth. Finally, he went to the speech podium, said his speech, and held a moment of silence for all who had died. Suddenly, an Anbu landed and fidgeted nervously, Hokage-sama. Siratobi turned and faced the Anbu and was about to lecture the Anbu on his timing when he'd noticed how the Anbu appeared to be sweating bullets and looked as though he was about to crap himself in fear. Saratobi's eyes narrowed, then widened as he realized that this was the same Anbu, rad out of specialized training for about two months, that he'd stationed at Naruto's apartment to make sure that he didn't leave the building. Outwardly calm, he dismissed the crowd, promptly led Rad over to a secluded area, then asked calmly, Rad, why aren't you at your post? Well, uh Hokage-sama, it's, uh, the poor man was barely keeping together, stuttering over his words, it's that I was at my post, but then, I saw my mother and father nearby below, and I uh stopped to say hi, and re-reaffirm, when my shift had ended. When I got back to my post at this rat's knees were knocking together like a pair of cymbals banging, the target I mean, uh Naruto was ah gone. Gone you say quick as lighting and with surprising strength despite his elderly frame, Suratobi grabbed the Anbu by the neck, lifted him up one-handed, and then slammed him up against the wall, and released some of his killing intent. At this the Anbu did lose control of his bowels. Ignoring the smell, Suratobi then added through clenched teeth and barely restrained fury, Anbu codename Rad, you are to immediately return to your post and see if there is a slim chance Naruto has returned. Should you find any fellow members of your unit you are to inform them to search for Naruto in all areas, leave no stone unturned. Also, tell them to listen carefully for any mention of Naruto's name or the terms, Saratobi hated to repeat this, fox boy, demon scum, or other similarly sounding colorful euphemisms. Dropping the disgraced Anbu, he turned to personally aid in the search, but then paused, and rat, you'd better hope that Naruto is alright, because if I find a single hair misplaced on his head oh shit it hit him, and he dashed off to where he'd last seen Hiroki. He found the man at a nearby bar, drinking with some other jounin. As he approached he'd heard words like, the nerve of that demon brat. Showing up like that and mocking Yandame. You should have heard him scream he then broke out laughing, his fellows joined in mirth. Suddenly those who were facing opposite him grew deathly silent and turned a ghastly pale at who they saw appear behind Hiroki. Hiroki, not picking up on this, asked, hey guys come on, I did it. I killed the demon. After all this time I finally had the balls to do what the Sandame refused to do. If anything that should make me a higak. His overblown gloating was suddenly cut off as he found his windpipe was held in a stranglehold by Siratobi's iron grip. He felt himself being turned around by the neck to face the Hokage, while still struggling to catch his breath. What have you done, you ignorant fool? Hokage-sama can't breathe. Hiroki gasped. Siratobi's eyes narrowed to slits, and his killing intent spilled out. He'd love to put this idiot six feet under right now, but he needed to know exactly what happened to Naruto. Reluctantly dropping the choking man to the floor, he then turned to the others at the bar, who sat quietly and desperately trying not to attract attention. You all have approximately five seconds to tell me exactly what this idiot told you. If I get even the slightest hint that you are lying, I will kill you on the spot. The terrified shinobi spilled the beans, flashback, Naruto Yuzumaki sir. As soon as those words were uttered, all of the adults in the area went deathly quiet. The three judges stared open-mouthed. Then their eyes narrowed. Naruto stood there, oblivious in his moment of triumph, oblivious to the shift in atmosphere. Most of the parents of the other contestants ushered their children out of the area quickly. The majority of said parents had wanted to see what would happen, but as much as they did, they didn't want their children anywhere near the demon nor present to see what they knew was going to happen next due to their young age. Finally, noticing the silence, Naruto blinked, then said, uh, is everything okay? I won, right? That means I get a prize right he exclaimed, tails and ears perking up in excitement. That was the final straw for the adults. A glass ache bottle came seemingly out of nowhere, smashing against the side of Naruto's head and leaving a large gash. Naruto's hand went up to his face and came down as he saw the blood dripping down the wound. Demon. Trash. How dare you show your face here. You deserve to die. Naruto stepped back in fear and his tails curled around him. What did I do? I thought I'd won. Why are they all mad at me? The sounds of their yelling was all-encompassing as the insults and slurs bombarded his sensitive ears. He felt a tug at his cloak and saw one of the judges furiously rip it from him and tear his precious cloak in half. You won't desecrate the Yandame's image anymore, you monster. The rest of the crowd was on him in a heartbeat and agony soon followed. Punches connected, canned eyes slashed and stabbed at Naruto's tiny body. They descended on him brutally shouting and spitting. Be please, whatever I did I'm sorry. Please stop Naruto cried through all the pain. This only served to piss the villagers off further. Oh, hear that, the Kaiubi says he's sorry the voice mockingly continued, sorry won't bring my daughter back. You killed her when you literally stepped on her. 
She was nothing but a bug to you. It won't heal my wounds. It won't stop my nightmares. By the time they had finished, Naruto was reduced to a bloody pulp, torn muscles and fractured bones. Several kunai and shuriken protruded from his body, and he looked like a grotesque pincushion. His tails were soaked in blood and had fur torn from them. Through the haze, Naruto felt himself being lifted none too gently, and after a few minutes, he was violently pinned to a wall, where he felt a kunai jam through his arms and then each of his tails. There he hung, with one final villager spitting on him, and a ninja, Hiroki, walking up, smiling with sadistic glee, and he shoved a katana into Naruto's heart. He then dipped a finger into the spreading pool of Naruto's blood and wrote the kanji for demon onto Naruto's forehead. The crowd, seemingly satisfied, stepped back to admire their work. One or two even took pictures. Finally, they dispersed. Then flashback, Saratobi's face was doing its best impersonation of Orochimaru's pale facade as he heard the fragmented, but no less horrifying, story. To the terrified shinobi, I will deal with you fools later. If any of you try to leave the village without facing me, I will see to it that you are bumped up to S-class missing nins in the bingo book he turned and dashed off the village wall where they said Naruto was essentially crucified. Upon his arrival, he found that Naruto's body was gone. How could this be? Saratobi mentally ran through the possibilities, one, either Naruto healed up enough to live and is now dragging himself about. Glancing at the pool of blood beneath where Naruto's body was pinned. No, if that were the case there would be a definitive trail. Okay, option 2, somebody took down Naruto, but who? As if on cue, the Anbu rat arrived on the scene, still reeking of his stench. Stuttering, he saluted, speak Saratobi growled, and you better have a damn good reason for being away from your post again. Sir Dodd yelped, while well, en route to my position, I encountered Anbu codename Weasel. He was carrying the subject Naruto Uzumaki, and instructed me to find you and inform that he is en route to Kanoha's general hospital. No sooner than he said those words than the hokage was gone in a shunshun. As soon as he disappeared, Rat fell to his knees and breathed a weak sigh of relief. Weasel, real name Itachi Ichiha, was many things. A veteran of the last great ninja war, he'd seen enough bloodshed in his short life, and it had taken its toll on him. However, he felt that peace was always worthwhile in the end. He also was somewhat aloof, even for being a member of the Ichiha clan. However, it wasn't a type of aloofness that let his name go to his head. Itachi believed that one must work hard to achieve one's full potential, rather than needlessly copy the works of others. Lastly, Itachi was patient, one had to be when dealing with lectures from his father, discussing the prestige of the Ichiha clan. However in this case his patience was wearing thin. He'd been off duty, enjoying the Kaiubi festival with his parents and younger brother Sasuke. He was tired of playing up appearances and desperately looked for an excuse to break away. Spotting his best friend, Shisui Ichiha, was able to finally gain permission from his father to head off on his own. He and Shisui had talked for a while, trading stories of their assignments. One particular note of interest was Shisui's recount of his meeting with a Miss Jounin, our something of course, Ichiha couldn't exactly go out and get drunk, public image, and whatnot, so eventually, after becoming bored, he broke away from Shisui and wandered about. Loud shouting got his attention, and he followed the sound. What he saw made him sick to his stomach. Shuringan blazing in rage, he saw a boy his little brother's age, the Kaiubi container's decimated body pinned up to the wall by kunai, and a sword right through his heart. Itachi immediately dashed up and reflected on the best course of action, based on the mandatory basic first aid medical ninjutsu that Saratobi had initiated at the behest of Tsunade. Although it seemed futile, he pressed two fingers up against Naruto's carotid artery, and after a few seconds, felt a pulse. It was weak, but it was there. Let's see, obviously he needs to go to the hospital, but if I remove the knives, he may very well bleed to death, taking a look at the blood pooling on the ground, although with the amount of blood he's lost so far that's pretty much moot. I don't know what kind of spinal injuries he sustained, and it's obvious he's got several broken bones and other injuries, so moving him is inadvisable. I should have left him and returned with some emergency medical personnel, but turning around for a split second, he noticed that a few villagers were eyeing him suspiciously. If they saw me check his pulse, then leave instead of gloating at the demon's predicament, then they may figure out he's alive, and then they'll finish the job. He made his decision. He took off some of his shirt, ripped it into fragments. Holding up a kunai that he always had on hand, he focused a little chakra into it, and then sliced through the protruding edge of the katana, only enough so that it wouldn't interfere with his transport of Naruto. Admittedly, his first mind was to pull the blade out completely, but he decided to be cautious. The longish piece left over that was protruding from Naruto's chest, was sealing any more blood from running out. Then, reflecting on his reflexes for kunai training, he quickly but carefully supported Naruto's body and pulled the kunai out of Naruto's tails and hands and tightly wrapped them with his impromptu bandages. Picking up the boy's bridal style, he carefully dashed towards the hospital, leaping across rooftops. 
On the way, one of his Anbu co-workers, Rat, caught up and left alongside him. For some reason, Itachi smelled something foul coming from the young shinobi, and he could have sworn it were Senate when Rat saw who he carried in his arms. Ignoring those trivialities, he ordered, find Hokage-sama as soon as he said this, he could have sworn the smell somehow got so bad that his fellow Anbu had to be reaching biohazard levels. Tell him that Naruto Uzumaki is critically injured and that I will bring him to Konoha General. Irat said nervously and leapt off in another direction. As Itachi continued, he felt a stirring in his arms and to his shock, he saw Naruto's eye that hadn't been swollen shut, open for a brief second and stare at him. Itachi's gaze met his, and Itachi nearly lost his balance and overshot his landing on his next leap. What was that? His Sharingan had seen something, but he wasn't sure what it was. Naruto's eyes closed, and Itachi could have sworn he heard a weak voice say, they said I won before Naruto relapsed into unconsciousness. As soon as he'd arrived at the hospital, he laid Naruto on the first empty gurney he saw and shouted that he had a boy who needed immediate medical attention. The staff did rush over, but as soon as they saw who Itachi brought in, they became downcast and started to turn away. Sharingan reactivated out of sheer fury, he grabbed the nearest doctor by the neck and was about to threaten him into treating Naruto, or he'd become a new permanent patient at the hospital, when Sirotobi barged in. Seeing Naruto, he immediately asked, Itachi, what is the problem here? Itachi kept it short and sweet, Hokage-sama, I found Naruto badly injured and brought him here, however the hospital staff refuses to treat him. Saratobi immediately seized the same doctor Itachi had been strangling and growled, if Naruto dies because of your negligence and refusal to treat him, then you're next, having a one-on-one -on -one session with Anko during her time of month. The doctor, terrified of the consequences, nodded nervously, of, of course Hokage-sama and he and his staff gathered Naruto and took him to the emergency room. Itachi and the Sandame followed and were about to follow in when another doctor, a brown-haired young lady in her late thirties, instructed them that they needed to keep a sterile environment. Her name was Makoto Nanahara, and she assured Sirotobi that not everyone thought of Naruto as a monster and that she'd do everything in her power to make sure he lived. Sirotobi turned to Itachi and the two exchanged accounts of what happened. Saratobi sighed and sat down, Hitachi, thank you for saving Naruto. It is up to the medics now, so you are hereby dismissed. Actually Hokage-sama, there is something I feel I should bring up to you. He brought up the phenomenon that he'd seen while he had traveled with Naruto. Saratobi grew serious, yet thoughtful, and made a mental note to research it later. I must classify this as an S-class secret, Hitachi. However, once again I appreciate your rescue of Naruto, despite the reprimand I know you are in for in for from your father. On that subject, the elders and myself will also require a meeting with you to discuss your other missions later this week. Hi Hokage-sama, but I don't think I was recognized, so there shouldn't be a chance of rumors flying about that the Ichiha were helping the demon. Itachi then left to return to his family. Sighing, Saratobi turned and stared towards the door of the emergency room. It was funny, in a sick sense. He was supposed to be the strongest in the village, and yet in this case, he was so well, powerless. Five hours later, Dr. Makoto came out of the air. She looked disheveled, but calm, and bowed before Sirotobi. Okajama, Naruto is stable. He had to be healed from multiple stab wounds and lacerations, broken limbs and blunt force trauma. He also lost an astonishing amount of blood, which was our immediate concern when he was brought here. We had a few close calls, but it appears that is glancing around for eavesdroppers, she whispered, dot tenant as well as his altered genetic structure is accelerating his healing. It doesn't mean he's out of the woods yet, but there is no almost no danger that he'll relapse. Physically that is she added, while shaking her head. Mentally, he's been through hell, and there's no telling how he'll respond. I can't believe the villagers. How could they do this to an innocent child? This is how they honor the fourth last wish if my sensei were here. Dot. But she's not, so we'll have to make do the sand aim interjected, although Saratobi felt his weary spirits lift a bit. Maybe there was hope for his people. I'm sure Naruto will appreciate that Makoto. At this another nurse came out of the ur. Doctor, he's woken up. Saratobi's relief was nearly shot to hell when he saw Naruto. Both of his legs and arms were in casts. His upper torso was wrapped in bandages and braces, and a large bandage covered the side of his face. Morbidly, Saratobi thought this made him look vaguely like a child version of Danzo. Each of his tails was bound in wraps, and some were held in a sling. Multiple IV drips and blood bags hung around him. The worst part though that seemed to cut right through Saratobi were his eyes. Both of Naruto's eyes looked completely dead to the world. He was just staring blankly and downcast. Naruto, you had us all worried for a second. How are you feeling? No response. Then more soothingly, he pulled up a chair next to Naruto's bed and asked, Naruto I know it hurts, but I need you to respond please. I need to know how you're doing and what happened. A meek voice, almost indecipherable, came from the child, they said I won. What did I win? I thought they liked me he then broke, tears streaming down his face.
Zeratobi wanted to hold the child, but couldn't due to his injuries. He instead placed one hand on Naruto's shoulder while the boy cried his heart out. I'm sorry so sorry I broke my promise not to go outside old man, I'll never break my word again. When the boy's sobbing decreased, Saratobi spoke up. Naruto, this is Dr. Makoto, she was the one who oversaw your healing. Naruto turned his gaze to stare at the doctor, then lowered his eyes and said, thank you Dr. San. I know I'm not worth it, but thank you anyway. Makoto interrupted and said, a doctor's job is to heal the sick and wounded, regardless of who they are. You never have to thank me for that young Uzumaki, besides you have already done more than enough good for this village. Bowing, the doctor departed, leaving behind a shocked Naruto. Saratobi then asked, Naruto, I do not wish to burden you anymore or to make you relive the horrible events that happened last night, but I need to know what happened and who attacked you. Naruto hesitated, then slowly repeated what had happened. He sobbed his apologies again to Saratobi for breaking his promise, but the festival looked like so much fun. And then he thought, just once that he'd be accepted by the people, that the judge in the contest had said he'd won a prize. He recanted slowly how they attacked him. After he recalled being knocked out, he thought he had a brief vision of somebody's red eyes before blacking out and awakening in the hospital bed. Saratobi took all this in, recording on a couple of sheets. He quietly waited for Naruto to calm down, and eventually the fox boy lapsed into sleep, exhausted by his ordeal. Saratobi nodded to the Anbu guard he'd stationed in the room, then departed. Naruto's mental condition hadn't improved as the week progressed. Saratobi popped in nearly every day to check up on him, but Naruto just responded the same way, just blankly staring downcast. If Saratobi was lucky Naruto would show emotion by turning into a crying wreck. As per Saratobi's instructions, an Anbu was always present when Naruto's condition was monitored, so as to ensure that no foul play was performed, but still Naruto just seemed dead to the world. Not even the promise of Raymond could bring him out of his depression. Clearly, Naruto was suffering from a type of post-traumatic stress disorder. This occurrence was inevitable in a shinobi village, as many who are still green go into shock, either after they've been forced to make their first kill, or tragedy has struck them or their teammates in the line of duty. Yes, the village did indeed have individual psychologists for this occasion, many of whom were mind jutsu using individuals and clans, however the effectiveness of this varies. For example, certain clans with certain abilities or bloodlines have often felt that their own kinsmen may be better qualified to console or treat one of their own. Naruto would certainly qualify for a session with an independent psychologist, and Saratobi immediately set out to claim one. However, the moment that he told them who they'd be treating, most of the psychologists had suddenly come up with full schedules and none were able cough willing cough to help Naruto. The few that were willing were just that, too willing. Saratobi realized that the worst thing would be to put Naruto with one, somebody who he'd never seen or known before, where he'd be skittish and uncomfortable, especially after this incident, two, a psychologist who knew enough about the human psyche to warp his mind further past the breaking point if they held a grudge against him, and last but not least, three, he was certain that one of the psychologists was on Danzo's peril. Sandane briefly considered simply having a Yamanaka altar, or at least suppress Naruto's memories of this incident, as well as all the others, then nearly felt sick that he'd even consider it. It was one thing to use such a technique on an enemy or threat, but another thing to use it on a child this age, never mind the one of his successor. Dot. Plus he ruefully thought, even if he did have that procedure done, Saratobi wouldn't delude himself into thinking that this incident wouldn't be the last of its kind, and then they'd be back to square one. He then confirmed this with Anoichi. The clan leader pointed out that memories were all chained together, a and thank you kingdom hearts, connecting and supporting one another, thus forming individual psyches. He added that in erasing the events from early on in Naruto's one life, where his mind and by extension personality had built its foundation, then there would not be anything to support the future events that occurred later on, which could have the effect of damaging or destroying Naruto's mind permanently. And, even if the desired result were achieved, it would require multiple erasing and alterations, possibly yielding the same result. It also goes without saying that either outcome might end up leaving his mind and body open for use by that damned Kaiubi. Naruto could either end up as a vegetable or a blank state, easily reprogrammed by anybody. I'd have similar results handing him over to Danzo or Rachimaru on a silver platter. Part of the shock was that truthfully, Naruto had already by this point figured out that most of, if not everybody, pretty much hated him. Now, he had the full realization that it extended to people just plain wanting him dead. How exactly was he to deal with knowing that? During one crying fit, Naruto asked Saratobi why everybody hated him so. The Sandane just sighed, feeling older than he'd ever been, and merely said that, people refused to let go of the past. Naruto never questioned him on this surprise, and Saratobi got the impression that the boy was thinking out loud and not actually hearing his response and his distress. What was worse was that his healing factor was apparently tied into his mood in this case. 
yes, Naruto did start automatically healing up shortly after he had been admitted to the hospital, but it wasn't nearly as fast as it was previously. If this incident had truly broken Naruto and he became an invalid, then if his healing stopped and he was attacked again, he might not survive at all. Another week had passed. Saratobi regrettably had little time for Naruto, needing to run the village. However, he was hoping that his duties would expose him to a trigger if you will, that would help him come up with a solution for Naruto. What he needs is an outlet of sorts. Few will let him join a trade or apprentice due to prejudice against him, but what damn it, luckily for Sandane, he was correct in his train of thoughts. He'd been strolling to himself on the one day he had free time to visit the hospital, when an ambu landed before him, with what else, another letter from another psychophantic merchant or politician, he honestly didn't care. Odd after speaking with the Anbu, Saratobi oddly, found himself recalling a memory of the day Naruto first received his new apartment, that's it. Dismissing the Anbu, Naruto made a beeline for the hospital. Once in Naruto's room, Naruto blankly turned his head to regard him. Taking that as a cue to begin, Saratobi started talking, hello there Naruto, how are you today? No answer, just the same blank stare. Sitting down next to the bed, Sandame started, it's funny Naruto. Not at your condition mind you, just something that happened earlier. I forgot that I was the leader of a shinobi village and that I'm required to guide my shinobi as if they were my children. That means I have to help them decide by giving them advice and then standing back and letting them choose their own path. Several people came to me asking for information on what to do in innumerable situations. Yet, through it all, I never asked one person what they wanted to do. He looked Naruto in the eye, inwardly wondering if he'd see the same phenomenon that Hiyashi and Itachi had seen. Naruto, I have a question for you. What would you like to do in life? I understand that you've had a terrible experience, but since you will have time to spare while you heal, I feel that I must ask. Is there something that you've always wanted to do? This seemed to move Naruto out of his depression, and he sat there thoughtfully. But Saratobi thought, as long as it keeps his mind off of his injuries and the townsfolk's bigotry. This new train of thought should help in that regard. I remember a while ago, when you asked me about Shinobi. How we did the things we did tell me, have you thought about that at all? Naruto continued thinking, and then slowly, he nodded. What was going through your head about Shinobi? Naruto looked up. I wanted to be a ninja. Dot. And why was that? Getting there, just a little further, Naruto's demeanor turned sullen and he responded, because I see them do all these cool things, and he lowered his head, everybody likes them everybody looks up to them, they're always smiled at especially you old man, Saratobi solemnly nodded, well Naruto, several of my anbu have seen your rooftop acrobatics. At this Naruto looked up, apparently surprised Saratobi tapped the side of his head. Shinobi are observant, remember. Your enhanced senses, such as that of hearing and agility, would be valuable assets for such a career, and I personally think that you would make a fine shinobi, based on what I've seen so far. Naruto seemed to become a bit more uplifted, even if you didn't become a shinobi, there are plenty of other professions out there that you could pursue, each one respectful in its, no Naruto's shout was pure absolute defiance. Got him back at last. Great going Saratobi you sly old devil. A shinobi is what I wanna be. Smiling, Sandane responded, you used the present tense Naruto, not the past tense. Are you saying that you haven't given up on that? Never. I will be a shinobi old man. But, I won't lie to you, Naruto, the life of a shinobi will be a hard one, and you may find yourself in many situations that require on-the-spot decisions, where the slightest missteps may be the death of yourself or your comrades. Knowing this, do you still want to proceed? Naruto took all this in, then in a moment of startling insight, asked plainly, how is that any different from my life now, old man? This resulted in a bitter, understanding nod from Saratobi. Naruto resumed a thoughtful pose. Maybe if I become a shinobi, I'll show them that I'm worthy of their attention, and that whatever they think of me isn't true. I know. The strongest ninja is the Hokage, and maybe I'll become the next Hokage. Then they'll have no choice but to acknowledge me. Saratobi gave a hearty laugh, well then, go for it. I admire your drive, young Yuzumaki. Rest up and recover Naruto, and I will make the arrangements for you to be able to attend the academy for the next term when it begins in the next few months. In the meantime, when you are fully recovered, I'll give you a few tips to start with. Become observant and explore to gather information. Know yourself, what you're capable of and what improvements are needed. Also, practice deception so that you may familiarize yourself with how shinobi may both see what is hidden and exhibit those traits yourself. Naruto heard all this, nodding furiously, then exclaimed, you got it old man, I'll get out of here and do my best, Dadabeo. Naruto's change of mindset definitely did him good, as he seemed to heal at a faster rate after gaining direction. After being fully recovered, he thanked Dr. Matoko and was released from the hospital. Naruto took Saratobi's words to heart. He would get people to like him by earning their trust and approval. He figured the easiest way for this would be to do things for them. He first attempted to go around helping people in their daily tasks. That didn't end well. 
Everywhere he went he was yelled at, items were thrown, and he was physically attacked several times. The hospital started to refuse him unless Dr. Makoto, Suratobi, or an Anbu had escorted him. If he managed to drag himself there alone, then they would often throw him back out, telling them not to waste their time. Trying his best not to despair, Naruto performed what became his usual routine, dragging himself to a safe, secluded spot, and simply waiting to heal. It never really took him long to recover, but for more serious injuries, he'd lie awake at night in whatever alley, box, or garbage can he'd be hiding in or had been thrown in, constantly vigilant in fear that someone would attack him while he was asleep. But still, it wasn't the physical wounds that hurt the most. It was as if before, the people were content to simply ignore him and glare if he was quiet and didn't associate with occasional beatings. Now that he went out of his way to make himself known, they had become bolder in their prejudice. One time, a seemingly kind old lady asked him to help her cross a road. Naruto happily obliged. He took her by the hand and gently walked with her only for her to pull a kunai out of her purse and stab him in the stomach. As he lay there bleeding, she had begun screaming that the demon was attacking her. A mob soon gathered, and the rest is history. The worst part is apparently others picked up on the trick the demon then try and kill him act, causing Naruto to become rather skittish around anyone who wasn't the old man or the Anbu he'd recognized. Truth be told, besides these incidents, if groceries weren't delivered to Naruto by occasional Anbu, he would have starved via malnutrition alone. He'd eat ramen every day if he could, but he didn't have that much cash, and also, no stores would really sell him any goods. One day, Naruto decided once again to try and make friends. He'd stopped by one of Konoha's many parks and watched some kids on a playground. He'd walked up and tried to introduce himself, only for a parent, guardian, or even a perfect stranger to grab him, warn him from corrupting innocent children and if they didn't beat him down, they'd throw him aside and ignore his attempts to apologize. Many nights ended with Naruto crying himself to sleep, for no matter what he did, he never seemed to get things right, nor gain anybody's approval. But still, for every hundred or so failures, there at least seemed to be one or two successes that managed to keep him going. For example, one running trip throughout the village ended with Naruto falling in love. Well, not literally dot but one day while traversing the rooftops, he happened to see the most striking thing, and he screeched to a halt. In the window of the store down across the street was a bright orange jumpsuit. Normally reluctant to travel the streets due to possible beatings, he leapt down and dashed up to the window, pressing his face up against the glass as he stared at this item starry-eyed. It was perfect for his ninja career when he started the academy. Looking down, he saw the price tag being obscenely cheap. Inwardly Naruto was torn. He desperately wanted the suit, had enough money from his weekly allowance, but he figured that he'd be overcharged as usual. Still dot for this he didn't care about the price. The shop's owner, a middle-aged man, sat behind the desk looking bored. It had been a slow day for him, and he was desperately wishing something would happen. He raised an eyebrow when he saw the demon brat walk carefully into his store, eyes glancing left and right nervously, and approach the counter. The owner didn't respond to Naruto's entrance. He knew of Naruto, and while he didn't exactly like the boy, he didn't feel like ostracizing a possible paying customer. Money was money, after all. Naruto walked up to the counter and asked in a small, nervous voice, ready to bolt at a moment's notice, excuse me, but how much is that outfit in the window? Now, the shopkeeper responded. His eyes bugged out. That orange travesty. Some crazy shinobi instructor had it ordered as a prop item for an instructional class on how now to blend in with the environment. When it and the copies arrived, the instructor paid, but later came back saying he didn't want the rest, which he was going to force his students to wear in order to drive the point home, saying that his class was laughing so hard at the prospect of a shinobi dressing like that thus, word spread like wildfire, and the message of his class was clear. That was all well and done, but now what would the shopkeeper do with the rest of the uniforms? He'd lowered the price as low as he could go, but still nobody bought it. It was almost as if the damn thing was mocking him. He'd almost given up hope to be rid of the eyesore. After a few moments of the shopkeeper's startled expression, Naruto's nervousness reached its peak, and he mistakenly figured that the owner was about to throw him out or throw something at him, so he turned around to dash out before it occurred. Wait the shopkeeper called out. Naruto, his hand on the doorknob, seconds from freedom, paused and hesitantly turned his head. Are you serious about buying that suit? Well yeah, I think it's cool Naruto responded. Finally the shopkeeper shrugged and not only pulled down the one in the window, but also brought out a large box filled with copies of the atrocity, in multiple sizes as well. Here, take them all. I've been trying to get rid of these for ages. Hell, I leave and only charge you for the one in the window and throw all the others in for free. Naruto stared at Penmund, not daring to believe his good fortune, though he was still on his guard. The price of the window display was about one and a half the purchasable ones, so it was a great deal. 
he handed over the money out of a frog wallet, Gama-chan that Sirotobi had given him a while back, personally, Naruto thought it looked odd, at first, but the old man said he'd understand someday, and besides, he'd grown attached to it. Naruto picked up the box carefully, causing the owner to get curious. I'd have thought the box would be too heavy for him to lift, but he's picking it up awfully easily, dot what is this kid doing? Naruto awkwardly bowed, saying, thank you sir and practically skipped out the door. Naruto's exploration of Konoha also went much smoother. He practically turned the entire village into his own personal gym over the next few months. He would be leaping and bounding over vendors and people, showing off his new uniform. Some people tried in vain to catch him or throw things at him, but most of the time they were so slow. The only ones who'd catch him were shinobi, although those that tried more often than not would either give up or if they caught him by surprise, they let him go with a warning. He ran up poles and hung from wires. It was odd, though, that he alone was the only one to do all these things on a regular basis. Why didn't anybody else try leaping off a tall building, using their tails, that is, if they had any, to steer through the air, grab a beam to swing through the air, then land easily? The wind rushing through his face was such an addicting feeling. One day, Naruto decided to try climbing the many structures in Konoha with his claws and leaping skills. He even managed to scale the Hokage Tower. This resulted in a humorous situation to him because the guards were panicking, trying to sense a chakra signature that would be in conjunction to any normal shinobi climbing the tower, but unbeknownst to them, he wasn't using chakra to climb. Saratobi had been in his office reading Itcha Itcha Paradise, giggling like a pervert to himself, when to his surprise, he'd heard a tapping on his window. Anticipating an attack, he whirled around with a kunai to throw, only to see a smiling, waving Naruto peering through his window at him. Saratobi immediately in the blink of an eye snatched up his book, stowing it in his robes, and opened the window to let Naruto in. He first thanked Naruto for giving him the idea to reprimand the guards for not thinking to consider not involving chakra usage, and then bribed Naruto with a Raymond coupon not to tell anybody about the book he was reading. Further exploration led Naruto to an abandoned building. Most wouldn't think of it as anything more than an area to dump refuse or to tear down and reconstruct. To Naruto, this was a paradise. He observed that the crumbling walls, holes in the ceilings, and the open-air basement area were perfect for training. Filing the location away for future reference, Naruto continued on his way. He eventually found himself sitting over a large complex, evidently some sort of private estate. It was very ornate, with multiple gardens and architecture that was pleasing to the eye. He saw people dressed largely in white and grey walking about. They seemed to be rather stuffy though. They all walked with near-perfect posture, save for some elderly, and extremely few appeared to be making small talk. The oddest things about them were their eyes. Their eyes were a milky white, with no pupils whatsoever. Dropping down to the ground and overcome with curiosity, Naruto looked both ways to see if nobody was looking, then he decided what he'd do. Now Naruto certainly didn't know he was considering trespassing on the Hyuga grounds. It wasn't like anybody took the time to explain these things, but at the same time he truly didn't know better. So he merely seized hold of the wall he sat on and climbed down. Walking up to the gate, he stared at it, noting that it was locked. Skipping up to the wall, his tails trailing behind him, Naruto jumped about six feet high into the air, grabbed an edge of the gate with his claws, and in one fluid motion, flipped his body over the gate. Landing down gently, he took in his surroundings. It was so quiet in this area, and very serene. He then heard people talking and quickly dived into a bush, being sure to pull his tails in completely to hide his presence. Two guards walked by, chatting nonchalantly, and they too had those strange wide eyes. Naruto waited for them to leave in their patrolling, and then he slowly crept out of his spot and continued his exploration. Opening all his senses, Naruto's ears still picked up that strange serenity, save for a few conversations about things he didn't yet understand. Something about main house and branch house and a matter regarding seals. Naruto continued until he heard the sounds of spar. Following the noise, he quickly climbed up a support strut and ran across the roof. Peeking down over it, he saw that he was looking down into a training area. In it he saw a few of the Hayugas sparring in some kind of training square. Further looking, he saw a young girl about his age, nervous looking, with purple hair, and across from her an elderly man with a small child about roughly a year older than Naruto. Both had the strange wide eyes, but curiously, the boy had a set of bandages across his head. The match was being viewed by a bunch of older, sterner looking Hayugas. Once the match was over, one of the elder Hayuga made a hand sign, and the man sitting next to the boy doubled over in obvious pain, clutching his forehead. The boy leapt up and ran to him, calling out his name in concern. That must be his father, Naruto thought to himself. His thoughts turned sad and somewhat envious once more. Before he could decide what to do next, he found himself being picked up roughly by his collar and staring face to face with a Hayuga guard. What freaked Naruto out was his eyes. Veins around the eyes bulged out, and the eyes seemed even more piercing. What do we have here? 
a rat running around in the house. No wait, a rat would be preferable. Demon, it is strongly recommended that you stay off the Hyuga grounds without invitation, although in your case that will never happen. He jabbed Naruto in the stomach several times with some Jukin, gentle fist strikes, knocking the wind and consciousness out of Naruto. Carrying the boy to the edge of the complex roof, he saw an open dumpster, and without a moment's hesitation, let the fox boy go, watching him fall and crash into the garbage. The guard felt some of his edge taken off his anger when he saw Naruto's unconscious body land in the trash. He then rubbed his forehead, and reflexively, the seal marking there. Whenever he'd seen another one of his fellow branch house members fall victim to that damn seal, he always got so angry at the injustice of it all. His Byakugan had activated instinctively, and he saw the boy sitting on the roof and went to investigate and take out some pent-up rage. Turning around, the guard found himself face to face with none other than Hiyashi Hayuga. Terrified, the guard stammered, Hiyashi Sama and then collapsed to his knees, dreading the activation of his seal. The Hayuga elder peered over the edge of the roof, and the Byakugan activated, seeing Naruto in the trash. After a moment, turning to the guard, he said, you are very lucky that that child is only unconscious and has no lasting damage. Inwardly, he cursed the elders and traditions that prevented him from acting in the boy's defense even more. Your punishment is to stand guard outside of that dumpster until Naruto awakens, making sure nobody else attempts to harm him until he does. When this occurs, see to it that he gets out of the area to his destination safely, but do it without being seen associating directly with him. He turned to walk away, then stopped, for future reference guard, potentially lethal force is not to be used on a child, especially one outside of our clan, merely being curious and exploring his village, and who was certainly not a spy under Henge, as your Byakugan would have told you, and for that matter, one whom the Hokage ordered not to be harmed. You are dismissed. The guard, knowing that he was getting off easy, breathed a sigh of relief as soon as Hiyashi disappeared. He then leapt off the roof and took his new post, albeit feeling embarrassed at the sight of a Hayuga apparently guarding a garbage bin, but relieved. About 10 minutes later, he heard a stirring from the dumpster. Running back around the corner so that his appearance wouldn't frighten Naruto, he used his Byakugan to peer at him through the wall. He saw Naruto climb out of the dumpster. He then, to his shock, saw the boy raise a hand to his eyes, wiping away tears. Demons don't cry then Naruto took off, scaling the wall and then leaping off the roofs in the direction opposite the Hyuga estate, leaving a very confused guard. Naruto stopped on a roof overlooking another small park. He sobbed to himself quietly, then when his tears dried, he got up and sulked, walked about, kicking a small pebble. It just wasn't fair, nobody would give him a chance. He heard the sound of children playing and peered around the bushes. He saw a group of children his age playing ninja. He started to climb out of the bushes to join them, but then froze. He saw some adults nearby laughing. Realizing that any attempt here would only get him in trouble, Naruto turned around and quickly vaulted over a fence up a wall and dashed off before he had the chance to change his mind. It wasn't long before he found himself in another section of the village that he never encountered before. The people here, for the most part, were black-haired and like the wide eyes, as he called them, they too walked with an uptight composure. Many were wearing a large symbol on the backs of their clothing that resembled a red and white ball. However, where the people in white, save for that guard, conducted themselves in a polite, if aloof manner, these people seemed to outwardly project the message, I'm better than you. The other people were bad enough. Not about to risk another attack on himself, Naruto kept going, 